You said you do not.
Hey everybody, we're having a minor technical glitch. We're gonna be going live in just a minute.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 AWCO Last Chance Conference. We are so glad you decided to attend with us, whether that be in person or online. We apologize for the technical difficulties we were having earlier. Um, thank you for bearing with us. First and foremost, for those of you attending in person, we would like to remind everyone, please wear your masks and maintain social distancing per state health department regulations. Seating has been arranged to allow for social distancing in the classroom. Hand sanitizers will be provided in the conference areas. This year, vendors will be spaced to allow for compliance and social distancing. And any giveaway items at the exhibit booths will be prepackaged. Uh, that goes for your breakfast, lunch, your breaks, um, all that's gonna be prepackaged as well, just to limit any contact. <clears throat> You'll find a copy of the agenda in your welcome bags. There's also signs posted around the classrooms and in the lobby area. The Zoom account is set to record the conference. So it will be downloaded and placed on the AWCO website for future viewing if needed. This goes for the new adjuster training as well. We will be placed on, that will be placed on the website so that insurance companies can use this as a future resource for trainers. In keeping with state regulations and in order to reduce close contact, there's gonna be no sign in for continuing education credits this year. The Zoom platform requires all attendees to log in with their email address and name. You will also have the option to create the evaluation form in the platform or attach SurveyMonkey. We'll, then down, we'll be able to then download the list of attendees names and credits will be distributed accordingly. In-person attendees will receive the evaluation form via email based on your status preference. Again, in-person and online attendees will receive a link to an evaluation form following the conference. Once the form is complete, you will receive your CEUs. CEUs for this conference will include credits for adjusters needing Alabama Department of Labor credits, property and casualty adjusters, CMC, CRC, CDMS, CWCP, Alabama RN, and CLE credits. Attendance for adjusters will be reported directly to the Alabama Department of Labor following the conference. This presentation will be webinar style, so only the presenters will be visible. And you will be able to submit questions through the Zoom platform during the conference. New adjuster training will be held tomorrow from 8 a.m. to noon. That attendance is completely online and there was a separate invitation sent out via email for this. Finally, we just want to, the AWCO board and officers want to extend a big thank you to the sponsors and vendors this year. This conference would not have been possible without them. <clears throat> the sponsors are gonna be featured either by video or logo throughout the conference. Both sponsors and vendors will be featured on the AWC website following the conference as well. We've also got several exhibitors participating this year. For those of you that are in person, please be sure to thank them when you see them. And now I'm going to introduce today's moderator to you. His name is Henry Levin. Henry has 40 years of multi-line property and casualty experience with a major emphasis in workers' compensation. Henry has both carrier and third party administration experience, having directed self insured workers' compensation administration programs in the Southeast. He served, he has previously served as president of the AWCO for multiple terms and is currently an active member. He is also a member of the Alabama Self Insured Association. Henry has been a speaker and moderator over the years in the workers' compensation arena and at annual conferences. At Willis Towers Watson, Henry provides claims advocacy and account management to clients located in the Southeast region and serves as area practice leader. He's a 1977 graduate of the University of South Alabama with a BS degree in education. He holds the professional designation of workers compensation claims law associate. He is also an advisory board member for the University of Alabama at Birmingham Center for Palliative and Supportive Care. He is the board chair elect for 2020. Please help me welcome Henry Levin. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning. So we're going to skip over the very first speaker that was on the schedule, and we're going to move right along with the topic of subrogation, and we're going to bring to the podium those two speakers now. We have Bill Austell, who is a founding member of Austell Lewis, Pipkin and Maddox. 
He has over 30 years experience in civil litigation. Bill uh, comes from a family of lawyers, his brother, his father, his grandfather, all of them were lawyers. He, his practice inclu includes automobile litigation, construction litigation, fraud, out outrage, bad faith, insurance coverage, premises liability, product liability, workers' comp, and wrongful termination. Bill holds a BS degree from the University of Alabama, and he got his JD from Crumlin School of Law right here at Sanford University. Bill Pipkin is a partner in the same firm out of the Mobile office of Austin Lewis, Pipkin and Maddox. He has a general civil practice focusing on the defense of workers' comp, personal injury, general liability matters. Bill was admitted to practice in Alabama and Florida. <clears throat> Bill is an Eagle Scout and a founding member of the Face Based Claims Association. He earned his JD from the University of Alabama School of Law in 1989 and his undergraduate degree in English and history from Birmingham Southern College, also right here in Birmingham. Please welcome Bill and Bill. Thank How many of you like to give money back? That's part of what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to talk about all the things that happen on the Who's happy to be out of civilization? All you are both civilized people too. So I'm happy. We've had so many things canceled in the past year that it's nice to finally have something to fruition and I'm glad to see all the smiling faces or smiling masks here today. Uh, Bill and I are going to talk about, like he said, something that, that is near and dear to all of our hearts, getting some of our money back. So it's subrogation and work time. Do you want to talk about this? The basic code section is in 25511 and it gives employer a statutory lien so it's not a good idea it's not a concept it's codified in the state of Alabama and it amazes me how many lawyers on the other side of the aisle don't fight about it well it's not something to fight about now like I said we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls on the way but the long and the short of it is if an employer pays out benefits compensation and medical and the employee through a third party action, third party recovery, doesn't have to be a lawsuit, it could be a claim, recovers money, then the employer gets dollar back. Like we'll, we'll get to the pitfalls. But it's, the whole concept is avoiding double recovery. So if the claimant gets money from work comp and then goes and gets money from a GL carrier, why should they get to recover twice for the same thing? The employer or the comp carrier are out of pocket. The risk, it's all about risk transfer. Big term in our industry right now, risk transfer. Who's really responsible? You, know, you start talking about Medicare, Medicare got ticked off because everybody was laying off the risk on them. Same concept. The risk should be with the person who's responsible. If that's another collateral or another entity, if, if you've got an employee out of their, their facility and the accident is due to their negligence, their responsibility, and there's a third party claim against them in recovery, then the employee ought, ought to get paid once. So one of the simple concepts that shouldn't go without saying is if we have a hundred thousand dollar lien, we don't ever get a hundred thousand dollars back. It, it, there's always there's always something that's going to come out of it. If you if you have a situation where you've got a lien and the plant attorney offers pay you anything above 70% of your money, take it and run. <laughs> because under the statutory formula, you don't get dollar for dollar. They're entitled to deductions from the lien, generally of attorney's fees and of pro rata share expenses. Um, 
There's a there's an older case. I think I'm the only person who likes that. There's an older case called Fitch, and it went through this process and said said okay, since the work comp carrier has a lien, what do they actually get? And they drew up a formula, and this is the formula. It's employer's reduced liability over third party recovery equals X over attorney's fees and expenses. Now, under the new math, I'm not sure that the kids could do that with all the boxes. You know, I don't know how you would manage that. But um, this, is, this formula has caused so much trouble in the industry because most, most lawyers are not math people and they cannot figure out how it's supposed to work. Um, you know, we've got some slides in a little bit to try and give you an overview, uh, but there's a case called Lambert uh, that, that lays it out and gives you numbers that you can work over and over and put on an Excel sheet and go, ah, that's how it works. Go ahead. For all you non-math people, you know, this, this, this part of the program is called How I Came to Terms, and actually I love Fitch, but I came to terms with Fitch. You can do all that equation stuff if you want to, but the long and the short of it is how much have we paid out? Let's say we paid out $100,000 in medicals and disability benefits. And then we're going to get caught for the firm total. So how much are we on the hook for? Say we're on the hook for an additional $300,000. So we're, we're, we're in this thing for $100,000 plus $300,000. $400,000. So, and then if they get a third party recovery, say, uh, third party recovery, say, a uh, million dollars, we're going to get dollar for dollar out of that. So, long story short, you add up what, what we're about to get paid back and what we're getting off the hook for. And then there's, there's, there's something here that we're not going to talk about, it's future medicals, which causes headaches. Let's just deal with it straight up. Straight up is we pay out of money. We're getting, we're liable for another 300. There's more than enough out there to cover it. So you take the 300, you add it up, and you take, you're, you're going to get 60% of that back, except for the back. But you're getting on, you're getting off the hook for the 300. So you take the 100, and then you take the percentage that you owe on the attorney fees for the 300, and you get the difference of those. And that's how much you, Oh my God. Oh my God, we own money. It's not supposed to work like that. So that's the long and the short pitch. And uh, it's a rude awakening sometimes. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is seeing down the road, don't have these discussions. A lot of times this comes up in mediation when the comp carrier is sort of in the back conference room at a mediation and all. Yeah, we're, we're, at, the, we're at the children's table. And everybody else is in the big room talking about the big one. So uh, these conversations need to take place well ahead of that. Yes. Uh, who's ready to calculate the fixed forming after bills overview? It's, it, is, it is very difficult. Um, and we can send you all this uh, presentation if you want. There's a case called South Alabama Utilities versus Lambert. And if you sit down and read it by or six times with a strong cup of coffee. Um, you will get an idea of how to do it and you probably will make an error the first one or two times you do it. Um, I, I, I'm, I like to give people hard numbers so they can look at stuff. In Lambert, uh, the employees found to be permanent total. And the trial court said the employee's accrued liability was 47 and change. Um, the trial court determined permit total to be 283,000 and change. Um, and the third party case settled for 300,000. And the employee's attorney's fees were 40% or 120,000. And, and so the employer said, well, I've paid nothing. What do I owe? Don't I get credit for the full 300 and I can go about my way. And, that, and so what the court did is they plugged the numbers into Fitch. They said the employer's liability is going to be at least 300. So they plug that over the recovery, then the X over the 120, 
did all the fun math that you see there. And they said, the employer is responsible for $120,000 of additional attorney fees. I go, oh my God, it's like, how is this? How do we, how do we owe additional money? And then what they did is they said, all right, we take your accrued money of your 47 and change, your PT of 283 and change, and your, and your 120,000 attorney's fees for a total of 451. And then they just subtracted out the third party recovery and said, your net payment net is 151 and change. All right, is everybody lost with that now? Okay, because every time I sit down and do this, I'm like, what, what do I want? I mean, so it's, it's a situation that if you've got a, a third party recovery, like Bill said, sit down and run some examples in advance and say, if I'm hit for, you know, maximum of current partial 66,000, and I've got some 33,000 in meds, here's what my lien's gonna be. What kind of recovery might they get on the other side? And what kind of exposure am I relieved from? And run some calculations and say, well, under example A, I may get money back. Under example B, I may break even. Under example C, I may owe the plaintiff an additional $30,000, uh, even though they got money from the third party suit. And you, if you do that early, you can look at your case and say, well, maybe I'd be best to settle the comp case. Maybe I'd be best to settle the comp case and close medical. Maybe I'd be best to sit back here and do nothing. Um, and and it's, it's something where if you get into it, we just recommend that you that you run some examples early so that you're like, ah, I'm not gonna get anything back under any circumstance I do. Maybe I can go to the comp lawyer if there's a separate comp lawyer, get my claim resolved, and then have a chance at getting something back along the way. Um, and you'll have situations where you've got one lawyer handling everything and one lawyer handling the top and one lawyer handling the tort. Out of the people here, who has cases where it's two different lawyers handling their subrogation claims? One to, okay, like five or six. Okay, in those situations, you have competing interest. Each lawyer wants a fee. The comp lawyer wants his 15%, so he's not gonna help you do anything with the third party case. And the tort lawyer wants his full 40% or 50%. And he's not gonna help you do anything with the comp case. And so when you've got those things, you know, you've got to figure out a way to try and get people to work together. And when they all want their fee, it's not gonna be easy. And a lot of this, I did divorce work in another life. And, you know, getting people to agree to these can be really difficult. But when you throw it in the lap of a judge who's going to get all these rights, and who's, you're not going to be happy with it. Stroke a deal that you can live with. And if you start in on this well ahead of mediation, you might be able to go ahead and put together a set of terms on the top case that you can live with. Recognizing that when you quantify something in a top case with a third party lien out there, when you quantify something, you may end up owing money, you know? Everybody takes into this statute like it's the, you're gonna pay me my money back statute. No, this is, this is we're gonna balance out who owes what statute, never lose sight of that. But there, you, and, and something that we're gonna bounce around if we have time through here is, is future medicals. Future medicals is a train wreck when it comes to this, because how do you quantify that? It, it, it gets to be very difficult. There's, there's some ideas and there's some things that you can do. But again, if you can go into this comp case ahead of a mediation involving a third party claim and get everything nailed down, you, you, you can go into the mediation in, in a position of strength because you've removed most of the variables. It's the variables at mediation that are gonna, that are gonna become your stumbling blocks as the comp carrier employer. You know, we don't know what our liability is. It's contingent upon certain things and it could be 100,000, it could be 500,000. That gets to be difficult. So, and, and it's like everything else. You're looking for opportunities here. 
try to objectively evaluate your comp case early, which you ought to do anyway. You want to objectively evaluate the third party claim. You know, how many third party claims are out there where the damages are just absolutely astronomical? You know, they're gonna, the jury's gonna light them up for $6 million, but the liability sucks. So, you know, or there's, there's a lot of things to look at in the third party claim. So you need to put on that hat and take a very objective, clear look at the third party claim. What are the realistic uh, outcomes with regard to the third party claim? It's like everything else. Who's the plaintiff's lawyer? What are the claims? What are the facts? Who's the judge? <laughs> you know, what county are you in? You know, every claims, claims bear. It's comp people. We know that counties dictate value in a lot of ways. So be, a, be on the, figure that out. So never under, underestimate the plaintiff's bar. One of the things that they're trying to do now in their tort cases is they don't prove up the medical. They just prove the injury and they figure they're gonna get a big enough damage without proving up the medical. And then they start arguing that you're not entitled to your lien on medical because medicals were not awarded in the judgment. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, at least as far as coming down through the appellate court system, but they're trying to find ways. In that situation, I would tell you, make sure you intervene. Make sure that you've got a presence before the court so that uh, the defense counsel and the plaintiff know that you have a lien and that it's your statutory lien is in line. Um, you may actually want to actively participate in the trial if they're not going to prove your medical and prove the medical so that you get it back. Uh, and in that situation, you may have to uh, be able to work your way around some of the pitch formula and not owe them a full percentage of their fee on the recovery because you proved up the medical portion of your claim. The whole concept of the Fitch formula of paying pro rata shares that the plaintiff's lawyer in the third party claim did your work for you. It's found money. I went out and I got this money that you never would have gotten and you're going to reap the benefits from it and you're, you need to pay, you need to pay my freight for getting me there. Well, not if you didn't get me there. So, and Bill brought up something that I think y'all need to bear in mind. And I've, I've, anyhow, intervention. Sometimes you do, you've got a comp case over here and a third party case over here. I prefer to intervene in the comp case regardless of the circumstances because I want, I want my statutory lien on record in the, in the third party case. I want the defendants in that third party case on notice of my lien because I think that there are mechanisms where we can hold the third party defendants accountable once they're on notice. I've not seen it done. I considered it once and then found an easier way. But once they're on notice, if you're on notice of my lien and then you take action to compromise my lien, then I've got, re I've got recourse against you. So I want the third party defendants to be on notice of my statutory lien in that third party case. And then like Bill said, intervention in that third party case gives me license to go and participate in that case. And you never know when you may need to participate. You may need to go do special verdict forms. You just don't know in the third party claim to make sure that things don't, sometimes the plaintiff's lawyer and sometimes the judge, they'll try to monkey with the third party outcome, like Bill said, to circumvent the statutory lien. Well, if you've got a presence in that trial and in that courtroom, you can, you can either eliminate that or at least make a record so you can challenge it later. And those are all valuable things to bear in mind. So. There's, there's really only one occasion where your lien can be calculated immediately when they settle or they go to mediation in a, in a tort case. And that's if you settled comp book and medical and exhausted all your liability comp case. When you have that number down pat, your lien is, is set, it's statutory lien. All they do then is plug the numbers into Fitch. And generally if you have say a $50,000 lien and they're gonna recover over 50, and you're like, well, I want my 50 minus the pro rata share of attorney's fees and expenses. And so you're basically going to get about 30 or a little bit less back. And it's, and it's just, it becomes simple. Um, Do the we have time? Oh, go ahead. The complicated one is you settle the comp and vote, but medicals are open. And then it's like, well, what kind of relief am I getting? In those situations, 
uh, we always want to close our medicals. So we start trying to see what we can give up in order to get rid of our medicals. And so we often will say, look, we'll, we'll waive all our lien and we'll pay you X to close the whole case. Is, is you, you have to run the numbers and you have to look at it well in advance of the mediation. Don't go into a mediation that's settling both a comp case and a tort case and just think, well, maybe we can come up with a resolution. You've got to actually figure, well, if we settle it this way, what happens? If we settle it this way, what happens? And go ahead and run some scenarios so that you can be the one kind of driving that mediation and say, well, this is the outcome I want to achieve. Let's see how we can get there. And, and because many people don't understand the Fitch formula, if you do and you run your numbers, you're, you're in a much better position when you go to talk so. You are in a position to recognize a good deal from a bad deal. And you can't be figuring that out on the fly in mediation. Five minutes? Cool. You want to open up a can of worms? Well, let's see. Any questions from here or the cloud? All right, then we'll go into the can of worms. You know, some stuff comes up that you might want to think about on a, on a, when you're dealing with a third party claim. Because uh, in a lot of ways, you're adverse to the plaintiff in the workers' comp case, but not so in the tort claim. So what do you, what do, you do, if anything, to help the plaintiff maximize recovery in the tort claim? That can get a little dicey sometimes. Whose side are you on? You're a defense lawyer. You're a workers' comp insurance carrier. What are you doing helping the plaintiff? Again, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's something to think about because there will be circumstances that will come up as the claim progresses where you may be able to partner to some extent loosely with the plaintiff's side on the third party claim. And you may want to because the more money the plaintiff gets, the more money you may get back, but then again, the more money you may have. So it's, again, you've got you've to go in and really carefully consider these things. Uh, this, this whole thing started out, like we said, is this really easy formula for getting your money back. And it has developed into a fairly complex system of you better figure out what's going on and you better figure out where you're headed sooner rather than later so that you don't you don't want to get you don't want to be the one holding the bag when the music stops so um what else were we going to talk about are we going to finish early and please everybody always bring notes yeah you get into some other issues and again i don't have the answer and Henry, tell me when we need to stop. I've had plaintiff's lawyers come to me before and tell me they're in trouble with or potentially in trouble with their client in the comp case, and they want us to continue TTD payments. Why do I want to continue TTD payments? Well, at that point, you've got decisions to make and discussions to have. I've done it once or twice. But if you do it, make sure you have a written agreement that they're not going to get their pro rata share of attorney fees out of that money because I'm giving you that money. Okay. I don't want, you know, I'm not going to give you another 40,000 in TTD payments and then have to pay 40% attorney fee on it because I covered your tail. Get that done up front and get it done in writing. If you want to go that way, or you can politely respectfully decline. And then you get into some issues with continuing to pay medicals. I've run into those before where, Things need to be done and the money's not there. And there's, there are issues in the comp case as to whether or not they're even owed. And sometimes a referral that may help the plaintiff in the third party case is being requested. And again, you know, everything, every fiber in my being says, we don't want to go there. We don't want to participate. That's not what we do, but it's something to think about. And the, short, the short version is there's no one way to handle subrogation and just make sure you take a look at it with an open mind and, and say there are several ways to do this. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Bill Austell and Bill Pipkin. One thing we failed to mention earlier is if any of you are trying to get on the Hyatt Wi-Fi, choose the site uh, Hyatt Conference and the uh, code is H2020. I'll repeat that for you. It's a uh, Hyatt Conference. I think it's the first one that pops up. And then your uh, code is H2020. Capital H. Yeah, thank y'all. I'll get your lavaliers yet? Okay. Okay, we're gonna now uh, have a topic called Body as a Whole, and we're gonna bring to the podium uh, Trey Dowdy. Trey's here now. He's a senior attorney at the firm Swift Curry here in Birmingham. Uh, while Mr. Dowdy's practice concentrates primarily on workers' comp and co-employee liability, he also handles automobile and premises liability defense litigation. Mr. Dowdy was on active duty from 1998 through 2002 and was mobilized on active duty from 2007 through 2008. He is, he, is an, he is active on the military law committee within the state of Alabama bar and graduated from the U.S. Army War College earning a Master of Strategic Studies as a distinguished graduate. Mr. Dowdy earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia and his JD from Cumberland School of Law at Sanford University. Mark Irby is a partner also at Swift Curry with more than 10 years of defense experience. Mark handles workers' compensation matters on behalf of his clients for two states, Alabama and Georgia. He, he, he works with industries such as staffing, construction, restaurants, transportation, school boards, healthcare, and many more. Mark holds a JD from Sanford University School of Law and a BBA in Finance from the University of Georgia. Go dogs. Y'all need to get up here. I did that for you, Fish. <laughs> yeah, I just got to set up the new slide for them. Hello, everyone. Good to go. Those two computers are like arguing with each other right now. <laughs> Okay, please welcome Trey and Mark. Their topic is body as a whole claim. All right, good, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, as is par for the course for 2020, uh, we had to have a hurricane blow through here last night. Uh, don't know if any of you heard it. Uh, I was up all night pretty much waiting for a tree to fall on my house. Um, 
So uh, apart from COVID, I don't want to say it. What's next? I don't know. Um, but uh, gonna gonna talk a little bit about the, the universe, the spectrum of body parts, uh, adding injuries, uh, and drum roll, COVID nineteen. Uh, and I'm gonna talk with that uh, with uh, my partner in crime here, Mark Irby, who's from the Atlanta office. All right, so. Uh, I like sports, I like football. Uh, I don't know who y'all's favorite teams are, but I always like to think in terms of sports analogies. Um, Bear Bryant, Pat Dye, Vince Dooley, uh, legendary John Wooden, UCLA coach for years. Uh, one of the things John Wooden said was, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when are you gonna have time to do it right? Uh, so I like to start off when you're, you're, you're analyzing claims is to to look at the, the basics, right? So Vince Lombardi held up a football at the beginning of each year and said, gentlemen, this is a football. Uh, so we're looking at the basics and we're going to move forward into to, to looking at adding injuries, body parts, claims, as you may move through a typical claim. Um, so everybody knows the phrase is arising out of in the course of the employment, right? So the plaintiff has the burden, the injured worker has the burden of proof to prove that the injury arose out of and in the course of the employment. Uh, these two terms are synonymous and they are, sorry, I'm gonna start my timer here. That's the military side. Um, so, so these two terms are synonymous and you have to prove both of them. Okay. Uh, does an accidental injury, does it arise out of the claimant's employment? Uh, does it an occupational disease? Um, is there a causal relationship between the claimant's work duties and the actual injuries that are being claimed? Uh, when you're looking at all these issues, you're often looking at whether, uh, was the claimant doing something improper, right? Was there a fight? Was there horseplay? Uh, was there, you know, something going on outside of the scope of their employment that they should have been doing? Uh, was there an idiopathic injury? Um, so at the end of the day, the job has to be the source and the cause of the actual injury, right? So there has to be the ability to trace the injury back to the job itself. There's gotta be this causal connection. Um, correlation does not necessarily equal causation, right? Uh, technical foul here on this little meme, false causality on the offense. Okay, um, looking at whether an injury arose out of the employment, um, again, you've got to be able to tie the injury into some sort of risk or character of the actual job, right? So this comes up often with idiopathic injuries, right? Seizures, some sort of personal condition that claimants may have whether they've got a comorbidity. Um, the Irby, uh, no relation to Mark, uh, the Irby case here, it's an older case, uh, dealt with an idiopathic uh, injury where the claimant had a seizure and fell off of a platform, perhaps like this guy in this, this uh, picture here. Um, ultimately, the court held that the, the injury, that was enough of a job connection because you had to, the claimant had to stand up on this platform. Sorry about that. That's the school calling to tell me we're two hours late. Sorry, phone was buzzing. <laughs> um, so in the Irby case, the, the claimant had to stand up on this three foot platform, had a seizure, fell off the platform. The court ultimately held that because of the requirement, the job requirement to stand up on this platform, that that was enough of a tie in to make it a compensable injury. Okay, so arising out of or not. Um, so I've got four kids. Uh, youngest is seven. He just started playing soccer a couple years ago. I've got three other kids uh, all the way up into college, Birmingham Southern, uh, for my 19 my year old. Uh, and he's trying to play soccer there. We have gone all over the country playing soccer. So when I was thinking of things that I could put in here for you all, I, I thought maybe I could find a good a good uh, soccer clip. So let's see if this will work. Okay. 
Yeah, so what's, what's interesting to me about that clip was, you know, if you watch soccer enough, especially when you get to higher levels, uh, kids that watch a lot of soccer, they, they emulate what they see, so they become very good at being injured. And uh, but what's interesting about that clip to me was maybe not that the guy grabbed the other guy, the, the guy in the red shirt grabbed the guy in the yellow shirt's hand and hit himself in the face. But if you look at the guy in the yellow shirt, he acts like this is just run-of-the-mill everyday activities. So uh, anyhow. I thought that was funny. Oh, going too fast. Okay. Um, so the next requirement is in the course of requirement. Uh, and, and just to sort of, you know, look at this contextually. Uh, you're looking at whether or not the injury took place at the proper time, at the proper location, in the proper manner. Um, so Anytime you're looking at injuries, going to these basics, you know, where was the person? What were they doing? What time was it? Uh, COVID-19, are they working from home? Are they having to do things that aren't, aren't, aren't normally within, you know, the purview of their job? Uh, and this guy's great, you know, you, you could add this meme, you know, why can't I come into the office, COVID-19, rather than aliens? Okay. Um, so when we're looking at adding claims, uh, of course, you know, we're looking at the full universe here. Uh, you frequently get into the issues of scheduled member injuries being removed to body as a whole situations. Um, you, you're looking at claims from the start. Is it, a, is it a minor injury? Is it an acute injury? Is it an occupational exposure claim? Is it an aggravation to a pre-existing condition? Is it a, a temporary exacerbation? Um, are we looking at multiple injuries? Um, depression, RSD, and now COVID-19. Okay. And really when you're looking at all these different injuries, maybe this is something to think about. Classic movie, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, if you guys are fans out there. 
but uh, multiple scheduled member injuries, maybe, maybe body as a whole, uh, shoulder involved there, hips involved. Uh, oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, we lost the. Well, I skipped a couple slides there, but that's okay. Uh, I was going to talk about Drummond and the pain exception, but uh, essentially everybody's probably heard of the Drummond case, right? So if you've got somebody that starts off with a scheduled member injury claim, what's the typical strategy that, that they're going to employ, right? They're going to try to drag it in to interfere with another body part, affect and interfere with another body part, the usual functions. That's a fairly liberal standard, so it's, it's not difficult to do. Uh, and so when you're looking at claims, you know, how do you defend against someone that's trying to, you know, maybe they have a foot injury, an ankle injury, a leg injury. How do you defend against that? Uh, you know, one of the things I would always say is, is uh, go back to John Wood. If you don't have time to do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it right? So when you're initially doing your claims investigation, you want to nail down the facts, right? Get statements if you can. Talk to witnesses. Get witnesses' names. Are the witnesses' names legible? You know, I, I'll get claims files and I'll see the, the list of witnesses and I can't read who the people are. Uh, do you have telephone numbers for the witnesses? Was there security camera uh, video? Uh, you know, those things get erased if you don't you don't act quickly. Uh, who is the supervisor? You know, nail down all of those things to try to figure out what the facts of the case are. Um, the credibility is going to be a huge factor when you're looking at efforts to take claims out of the schedule and into a body of the whole situation. Do you want to do surveillance? Um, you know, all of those things, take depositions, nail down the facts. Um, multiple schedule member injuries. Uh, so if the schedule lays it out, uh, that's going to be what they're going to be compensated for. Um, and uh, if there's two members of the same class, uh, for example, um, two arms, two legs, sort of like the Black Knight, uh, whatever the, the schedule lays out is going to be uh, what they're going to be entitled to. So it's not going to be a body as a whole situation. Okay. So so we're trying to do rapid fire here. And it's my understanding these slides are going to be available um, at some point. But rapid fire, as we know, it's been 2020. Um, and we've got all sorts of, of new things that have happened over the last several months. Uh, I, I too am glad that we are here in person that we were able to do this. Um, so what's next? Uh, COVID-19. So what are we going to be looking at with COVID-19? Uh, you know, Alabama has no presumption of relatedness to COVID-19 uh, like some other states do. Um, so, you know, it's is it an injury by accident? Is it an occupational disease? The standard under an occupational disease is that it, again, has to arise out of and in the course of the employment. Um, and then it has to be due to hazards in excess of those ordinarily found in employment in general and peculiar to the occupation which the employee is engaged. Um, so if they can meet the standard, again, it's, it's going to be a higher standard for an occupational disease standard. If they can meet the standard, uh, then it's going to be treated like a body as a whole situation uh, with calculations. Um, perhaps one way to look at COVID-19 claims and strategies that a crafty plaintiff's attorney may use, uh, it may be something like RSD. So where you have an ankle injury initially and you get an RSD and they're trying to claim the pain is debilitating. Uh, maybe the COVID-19 claim may come into play like that. But again, causation is going to be a huge issue with COVID-19 claims. Um, is this a Pandora's box? I don't know, perhaps. Um, you know, there's all sorts of permutations, second, third order effects that can come about. Uh, somebody gets an initial injury um, and, you know, they have to go to physical therapy, right? Uh, well, we, all, we all know if someone has, an, say, a shoulder injury, they go to physical therapy, they injure the shoulder in physical therapy. If that was authorized, we're on the hook. But what if they get COVID-19 or they claim they get COVID-19 from therapy? You know, what if they're in close contact with a therapist that comes up positive? They've been seeing them three times a week. Um, again, it's their burden of proof. Um, and so, you know, we would go down that path. Um, what about if the employee refuses to, to treat? You know, what's gonna happen at that point? Do you suspend benefits? You know, if they refuse to treat because they're afraid of getting COVID-19. Um, 
got any Alabama fans out there? <laughs> Recent Georgia Alabama game, Nick Saban, he made it. But. And so this Pandora's box of COVID 19. Um, what about folks, you know, they develop a frozen shoulder because they refuse to go to PT because they're worried about COVID 19? Uh, a lot of questions. Um, could it be an accidental injury? There's some pretty pretty crafty claims attorneys out there that might, might try to claim that. Um, return to work teleworking. What about folks that are teleworking at home uh, and they have injuries at home and this all started because of COVID. You know, again, second and third order effects. Does the person teleworking, do they have a telework agreement at home? Laying out the you know, time they're gonna work, where they're gonna work in their house, and what they're gonna be doing. You know, if they get injured by the pool, should they have been you know, working by the pool, is that going to be related? Um, and what if they, what if they're already receiving TTD and they're laid off? Uh, they're still going to be entitled to, to uh, um, they're laid off due to COVID. They're still going to be entitled to like, TTD. So uh, a lot of questions. Again, this is just sort of the once around the universe and I'm going to hand the baton off to Mark at this point. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. I appreciate that thorough look into that subject matter. And so I'm going to be delving into the successive injuries, the fun things that happen in claims when someone gets a, an injury and then lo and behold, they get more injuries. And so this clip kind of might help explain what that feeling is like. <laughs> Uh, so, how many times do you have a case where the injured worker just simply hurts a body part? One body part goes to the doctor, heals up, and the claim just dies a natural death. Happens hardly ever, right? Uh, unfortunately, far too often, we'll see an injured worker get hurt. They will hurt their back, and then all of a sudden, two weeks go by, maybe two months, their neck starts hurting. And then they strain their arm while lifting something else. And then it just becomes a snowball effect. And then before you know it, our pet's heads are falling off. Uh, so um, it's important that we keep these claims under control, monitor these complaints closely. I know it seems obvious, uh, but sometimes doing the obvious can be the hardest thing you can do. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about today how to deal with these types of successive injuries complaints and the best strategies moving forward with them. And now the code section states that if someone has a subsequent injury after a permanent injury, the employee is only entitled to the compensation for the second injury to the extent that the first injury had never occurred. So what does that mean exactly? Well, the first injury creates a baseline threshold for that second. Injury. These cases are very fact dependent. We need to explore the extent of any prior injury and what kind of effect that can have on the current condition. Thus, we have to keep in mind that but for the pre-existing injury not, not being present, there is a certain degree of disability that on the second injury that would not be present in the injured workers. Ultimately, um, when, when they're back at work, we need to monitor their current condition. 
We need to make sure that these treating doctors address the specific injuries and the degree of disability accordingly for each specific injury. Now, I, I'm sure you've had many cases where an injured worker had chronic conditions that pre-existed their original work injury. They lift something at work, perhaps they feel a back strain, they go see the doctor, uh, they report it, um, they get some relief from that injury, from that strain, but they also had that chronic pain that was already existing. And so uh, does the fact that he hurt his back that day, that he suffers a minor strain, even though he has chronic injury, does that mean we have to pay for every visit for his back for the rest of his life, even though Alabama is a lifetime medical state? Well, the, the answer is no. If a doctor indicates he needs surgery two years later, that doesn't mean we necessarily have to pay for that surgery because he suffered a lifting injury two years ago and got treatment. We need to show the doctor records of his prior history to ensure they attribute the injury to the pre-existing conditions and not the minor strain that he incurred while at work lifting maybe two years prior. Now, I'll take you through a, a couple of uh, specific cases that are relevant to this topic. One, and one specifically is the Waterworks versus Iceman case. Uh, that's a good starting point for this. And in, in, in that case, an injured worker hurt his left shoulder in 2003, settled the claim with medicals open, had a 10% PPD rating, and then he got injured again in 2006, injured the same body part, same area of that left shoulder. Waterworks, his employer at the time, they asserted it was a continuation of the 2003 injury. As a result, they argued that the degree of injury should be limited to the degree of injury that would have resulted from the 2006 injury had the 2003 injury not occurred. Ison, the injured worker, testified that he had been at work without restrictions for several months and he had not needed medical attention for several months before that 2006 injury, before that second injury happened. Uh, his doctor later opined that his 2006 injury was a new injury, even though it was the same body part in the same area of the shoulder. He was issued a 12.5% PPD rating for the loss of use to his left arm. And the court ended up not considering the facts of that 2003 injury because they had deemed that he had returned to work and had fully recovered prior to that 2006 injury. So um, it was considered a brand new injury and they, were, they did not consider the increase from the 2003. Now a twist on that ruling is the ruling from Champion v. Williams and that claim that the injured worker settled a 1988 claim due to a back injury, had a 40% PPD rating, uh, but then he returned to full full time work with his company. He suffered another injury in 1991 while lifting a piece of equipment. Uh, that injury also required surgery. So the question was whether the award of PPD should be reduced by the amount of the previous award from 1988. <clears throat> Ultimately, the main question came down to whether he was fully recovered from the previous injury as to whether there would be some apportionment to the second injury. The injured worker's doctor indicated he told him one month prior that he was having a hard time working due to the pain that he had been incurring. And he also continuously told his supervisor every, just about every day when he came into work, my back's killing me, I'm having a hard time working. Well, and he was also working light duty at the time of his 1991 injury, his second injury. So the court held that it was undisputed that he was already suffering from a pre-existing injury where he, although he had returned to work, those specific limitations um, made it to where they could portion his 1991 disability and factor in any potential increase from the 1988 Now, there's also the, the aspect, you know, this could be a cautionary tale when you have successive injuries with the same employer, town of Addison versus Cook case. And, and in that case, you, it, the court factored in the combined effect of two injuries that occurred to two different body parts and, and what that, what are the implications from that? And in that case, the injured worker hurt his left eye in 1993, 25% vision. He had the uh, give up his driver's license. He was unable to drive. Uh, and then a year later, he suffered an injury to his back. He underwent surgery, underwent epidural blocks, and he showed the court how his back range of motion was limited permanently 
as a result of that second injury? Well, the court deemed that since he had two permanent disabilities successively, um, he had difficulty walking on the ground, he uh, was unable to return back to his old work, he was unable to do manual labor, which was his skill set. The court determined that he was due a PTD award, uh, permanently totally disabled. Um, so that's something that is a concern. If, if someone suffers a permanent injury, they're back to work, and they suffer another one, even though it's a different body part, the combined effect, the court will come down on you sometimes and, and issue those perm, perm total awards. That's something to, to, to be aware of. And, and also uh, something to also be aware of, you do get a credit if that does happen uh, for any previously paid up benefits. So I guess that's a small consolation that it's that credit. <laughs> so um, when someone smells that PTD award, maybe this is something that uh, they might try to do if I can get this working. Oh, here we go. Got it. This guy uh, just getting some coffee. Uh, let's throw some ice on the ground and see what happens. Oh, sorry. My bad. Well, I can, you know what? I'm just gonna, it's a really funny video <laughs> in which a guy comes into work and he's making coffee and he throws some ice on the ground and he looks at the ice and he does the worst fake fall you've ever seen. So um, I'll just, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Yes. Are we running low on time? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, looks like we are running up against time. And uh, y'all have been a fantastic audience in person and on Zoom, I'm sure. Uh, do, is there any questions that you have? <clears throat> no, really? I explained it so well, you understand it perfectly. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, I, if you ever do have some questions, uh, you can uh, look up Trey and I's contact information and uh, please give us a call. Um, I, I do work in Alabama and Georgia. So uh, thank you so much. Y'all been great. <laughs> Thank you, Trey and Mark. So we're going to give you all a break in about 45 minutes. But before we do, our next topic has been pre-recorded. So we're going to bring in a lawyer, a doctor, and a claim professional. So your lawyer is Jonathan Berryhill, a native of Birmingham. He's been uh, counseling and defending employers, self-insured companies, self-insurer funds, and insurers and workers' compensation claim litigation and related matters across the state of Alabama for the past 20 years. Jonathan is currently sitting as chair of the Alabama Workers' Compensation Defense Lawyers Association. He has also practiced in the areas of insurance defense litigation including personal injury, trucking and transportation, products liability, technology and intellectual property, small business representation and employment law. Jonathan received his BA degree from Birmingham Southern College and his JD from Birmingham School of Law. Dr. Jake Epker earned his BA in psychology from Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts he subsequently attended the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, where he earned a PhD in clinical psychology following graduation. Dr. Epker completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in health psychology with a focus on chronic pain management. His practice has primarily a behavioral medicine focus with emphasis on the evaluation and treatment of individuals with work-related injuries including PTSD, chronic pain, and those being considered for spine surgery. He is often asked to perform IMEs and SMO evaluations or to consult with attorneys when expertise is needed to determine the type and extent of psychological injuries in medical legal cases. Davida McCluskey is your claim professional. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Lewis University and a paralegal degree from 
Lewis University School of Law. She is active in the workers' comp community, serving on the board of AWCO directors and is also on the Asia Conference Planning Committee. She has been in claims management quite a, quite a number of years. Currently working as a claims adjuster for Millennium Risk. So please, you gonna come up here, David? Yeah. David is coming to the podium and then everything else is gonna be on the screen, I believe. Thank y'all. Oh, 
during the first position. And I usually give the example of black lawn and coal miners, general investment lands, black lawn and coal miners. There are some um as a third coast, I was playing in the other neighbors that people who worked in white tracks and white factories that you would see that you wouldn't let it to the only sort of um employment in general. And one of the things that we sort of come back about about is describing when they talk about an occupation in the
Thank you, Davida, Jonathan, and Dr. Epker. Are there any questions for this team? Okay, before we send you off to break, I wanted to mention that we are going to give away door prizes today at the end of the conference for those of you who are here in person. And for those of you who are participating virtually, there have been poll questions uh, that are uh, being sent around. We're going to be giving away door prizes to those of you virtually who are participating in answering those poll questions. So it'll be based on participation. So as you see them, be sure to participate. Um, we're gonna meet back here about 1030. As you're walking around, please, we encourage you to wear your mask outside in the perfunction area, visiting the, the vendors. Please notice the, the vendor sponsor boards. We're really thankful for all the organizations that helped to make this possible. And we'll see y'all back at 1030. Thanks. Wait, Lily, turn that camera back on.
Is that camera on?
Okay. So, so, I had to reorder. Re so then, because he didn't yeah. respond, and I said that. Oh. Well, then they're not going to see. Well, they don't need to see PowerPoint. No, that's not Now could what? Up change. It'll change up there. If I just don't touch it, just because it's very very messy. Just don't. Can we kick them out? Hide on video. Well, that that's just hide them from that. So what I want to do
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna get started back. And before we bring our next speaker to the stage, uh, we're gonna uh, introduce Bailey Mack. She is an AWCO board member. She's gonna go through some of these poll questions for those of you who are participating virtually. So here we go. Hello, everyone. So we're gonna do some fun poll questions today for those of you at home. And we have some cash to give away. Um, how this is going to work is I'm going to ask the question, then I am going to give you a couple of multiple choice. The first person to comment in the chat box with the answer wins whatever the prize is. So we're going to start with a um, $50. Okay. If you could choose a superpower, what would you choose? Would you choose Number one, speed. Number two, strength. Number three, telepathy. Number four, invisibility. Or number five, flying. Woo! Zachary Hayden, you have won $25. Oh, I'm sorry, I said 50. I counted. I'll, I'll take the other 25 of that, my bad. So 50, Zachary Hayden. Okay. 
Yes, sir. All right. So, the next one. This one is for $25. Who is the president of AWCO? Number one, Sean Cole. Two, Sarah Ryan. Three, Jessica Adams. Four, Bailey Mack. Or five, Beyonce. Let it rain on it. And by the way, the answer is Jessica Adams. James Vito, James V I T O Vito, Vito. Okay, we'll do one more right now, and this one is a really fun one. I just got to find it again. Hmm. What? This one is for a hundred dollars, guys. What is one perk of AWCO membership? Single choice. Number one, you get to hang around with Henry Levins. Number two, free conference attendance. Or number three, security clearance. All of the above. All of the above, good answer. <laughs> Beth Ledbetter. This is for virtual. So we're going to do in-person stuff later today. So do not feel like you guys are not getting anything. I'm so sorry. She said Beth Ledbetter. Okay. Okay, so today, so far we have Zachary, Hayden, um, a winner, James Vito, and Beth Ledbetter. Congrats, guys. Thank you, Bailey. Okay, our next speaker is Tim Donahue. He started the law firm of Donahue and Associates in 2002, providing individualized representation using the large law firm structure. Tim has tried over 90 jury cases to conclusion and specializes in governmental and municipality liability law, as well as construction litigation and workers' compensation. Tim believes in the effectiveness of alternative dispute resolution. As such, Tim is a registered mediator with the Alabama Center for Dispute Resolution, which allows him to effectively resolve matters outside litigation for both his clients and or parties seeking his assistance. Tim's gonna talk with us today about data storage in the electronic age. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Henry, for that kind introduction. Um, we are in a weird, weird time, but we were born way back as teenagers, anybody old as I, that drank Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> they said 2020 was gonna be a bad year. So <laughs> there you go. Um, to the people on Zoom, uh, I always heard that TV put 10 pounds on you. Uh, since we've been Zooming over the last six to eight months, I think it puts 10 pounds on you and wrinkles. So it's just not a very flattering format. All right, I'm gonna ask this question before I get into the main topic of my speech, and that is electronic storage. Uh, how many people have found it more difficult over the last five years that litigation has become? Has anybody found that it's been more difficult than in years past? How about more adversarial? Okay. And higher settlement demands from the plaintiffs. On cases that are clear, uh, I don't know where they're coming from, but they're still using that 99% to 100. And I find that to be more adversarial and harder to deal with. So that's the reason I said that last. But I wanna get into what I see as a trend for the next five years and that's Electronic Stored Information, or ESI. I'm getting, I used, I got them early as much as five or six years ago in a third party litigation or general liability litigation, but now I'm seeing letters in workman's compensation 
as far as a protection letter. And that what that protection letter is, is the plaintiff's attorney is asking that we preserve all evidence. And you go, what is all evidence? And when am I triggered to start saving it? Well, the rule or the law that has been handed down so far, and I'm not gonna get into cases because you can all read the cases, says when it is likely or probable that litigation is anticipated. That's pretty broad. So in today's world, do we have to anticipate that every injury is going to lead to a lawsuit? And my answer to that is, I don't know, but we need to be on the safe side when we're dealing with it. Because in these protection letters, lawyers are asking for all electronic information that you have. What do we use now? Totally to use a computer, right? Everybody's basically paperless. So everything's stored electrically. And they're asking from the first report of injury, which you would have. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Okay. It goes I don't know what that was, but okay. Um, it goes anywhere from your first report of injury, which we know is producible, statements from other co employees of what happened. Okay, not too bad. Your investigation, now we're starting to get into maybe work product. So is that discoverable? It's stored. It goes on even further. The cases even go further. That is cell phones. Have you had any communication on your business cell phone regarding the claim? You're obligated to serve, to save it. Personal phones I've been able to defeat so far because it's outside the work uh, workforce, but I see the day coming when they'll be, you'll have to produce those as well. Uh, text, any text that you have regarding the claim, claimant or facts of the case need to be preserved. Social media, anything you put out there, I hope, I hope all y'all have a social media policy but do not let employees comment to other employees by way of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, things of that nature, because that is all discoverable and has to be retained. What about videos? A lot of employers have videos of the work scene. How many times have we been faced with this situation? You have a video, a person comes to you and says, I was injured, but I'm fine. I don't need to see a doctor. I'm, you know, it's at the end of the shift I'm, and comes back the next day. All right, you don't even write a first report of injury, right? Or some people do, some people don't. All right, then it happens a week later, he goes to his family doctor, right? The doctor says something, well, when did it start? Well, it started at work a week ago. You don't hear about it for another week because he, he or she thinks it's gonna go away. Then they report it as an injury. So you have to do some investigation. What happens to that video in the time? Most of the time it gets looped over, doesn't it? Depending on your loop, whether it's seven days, 14 days, 30 days, three days, it gets looped over. Then the employee goes, hires a, an attorney and you get this preservation letter. I want copies of any and all texts, emails and videos of the accident scene. Then what do you have to say? We don't have the video anymore. It's been looped over. It presents problems. 
And then you have not only, here's the, basically the bottom line I'm getting to. In today's world, when we have an injury, we have to preserve everything. I mean, literally everything. There has been a case out there where an employee was driving their employer's car and had an accident. And the employee brought a third party liability suit against the manufacturer of the car. The employer kept the car for two years in storage and then got rid of it. Why the employer did not sell the car to the plaintiff's counsel and let them store it, I don't know. Because <laughs> that's what I would do. I wouldn't pay for the storage. But what, I, what happened next? What do you think happened next after the employer got rid of the, the vehicle? A spoilation claim was made against the employer for getting rid of evidence in a third party case. And they were found liable of spoilation for not keeping that car until the case was adjudicated. So as HR, as benefits director, when you get a claim, I'm going to tell you that it's gonna be imperative that it's gonna be more work, it's gonna be more time consuming than just filling out the first report of injury and sending it into the insurance company or your third party, um, uh, third party uh, administrator. It is going to take you time. It's gonna take you time to download every employee that was associated with the claim, it's text messages, email messages, because there's a thing, if, if, you, if you don't know, there's a thing called metadata. And metadata is attached to every email that you send. For instance, if Henry sends one to his coworker, Henry doesn't know if the coworker sends it on or not, but a forensic guy on a computer can come in, an IT guy can come in, pull that email and tell you how many people, how many times that's been forwarded and who it's been forwarded to. So that is, that is something that is, again, I hope everybody has policies that they don't allow employees to do that or, or coordinate or limit the amount of people that have access to these emails, texts, and first report of injuries. Personal comments are a no-no. That will show up. Uh, I've seen it before in a file when someone says, I think they're faking. That is all discoverable now, because it's all part of the file. So be careful about what you say and how you say it in those texts and emails and your reporting. And the reason I say that, that it's important to gather all these information, and I'm talking about everything I just said. I know it sounds like a lot when you're talking about text, emails, uh, Facebook uh, post, but it's, it's necessary, and why is it necessary? Sean and Gina will tell you why. Because if we don't have it, it's indefensible, right? You destroyed it. So it must be true what my client's saying. It's bad information, and you don't want it. You didn't want it, you didn't want to keep it. And as a defense attorney, that, that scares me to go in a courtroom after being placed on on notice that they want all this information and that we don't have it, or it's unretrievable at this point. And that's the way we're going. So be careful when you get these preservation letters to take them serious. I've seen a lot of people just get them and put them in the file. And then when it's time, when the lawsuit's filed two years later, a lot of the co-employees are not there anymore. Their cell phones have been deactivated. Uh, whatever the case may be, and you, you can't produce anything. And it's very hard to defend that. And today in the judicial world, it's very hard to defend. Because not only the judges don't like it, they, they take it out on the rulings, okay? That we didn't preserve it. And then you're going, to get a, you're going to get a claim on top, not only the workman's comp claim, you're going to get a spoilation claim. 
I've had two cases so far that I've tried that part of the jury charge was spoilation. And it came about very much as I just said. An accident happened, waited two years. We got a preservation letter six months before the two years ran, 18 months after the accident. Everything was gone. And the judge gave, gave notice or gave a jury charge on spoilation. Um, now, what I'm about to say now may be a little bit controversial for some people, maybe not, but in light of this electronic age we're in, you need to have a policy as far as retention, but I would be very careful about putting that policy in writing. Because if you don't adhere to it, to the word, to the letter, it's going to come back and bite you. I would give training on it. Keep, keep track of training of your employees that you did have a policy. We talked about it, so forth and so on. As Henry's introduced me, I do a lot of police work. And I've seen small towns in Alabama adopt a policy and procedure from the Birmingham Police Department that has a thousand employees and they have four police officers, and it's that thick. And believe me, they're going to be held to know everything in that policy and procedure manual, even though it's a four police policemen uh, uh, organization compared to Birmingham. A lot of people think that we can go in small towns and small businesses if you're a small employer, and they expect you to push a button like your IBM and print out all these documents to give them. And that goes back to what I said earlier about litigation, in my opinion, has become more adversarial. Remember the day when you wrote a letter and you placed it in the mail and it took two days to get there and they wrote you one back and it took two days to get back? That's not the way the world is now. Now it's an email, push, I want an answer. And it's getting more and more that way. And you gotta be prepared as this comes along. It's already here, but as it gets more and more aggressive. And, I, and I've heard um, through the latest, uh, the Lawyers Trial Association, I forget Alabama Justice, I think they call it now, or whatever used to be the Alabama Trial Lawyers Association, that they are pushing more and more preservation letters. And the scope of those preservation letters are getting broader and broader. So it's gonna require work on our part to, to, to keep that, those records and keep them where they're available. Um, that's basically all I have. This was more of a talk that I wanted to share with you about what I see over the next five to 10 years as to where plaintiffs can make more claims than just the work comp aspect of it. I think spoilation will be one, and they will use the lack of retaining the evidence or storing the evidence as additional information for higher rewards as far as compensability. So with that, I've got a few minutes. I'll be glad to take any questions. I don't know how this is working. You know, I don't know how this is working over uh, the Zoom, but will you, if I got any questions? Okay, anybody have questions in the room? It's not too prevalent in the work comp aspect right now, but I have seen it. I talked to Mike Fish. He's gotten a few. Um, Mike had a good point. He's, he's prepared preservation letters um, himself on behalf of the employer to send to the plaintiff because um, it's been real prevalent in third-party litigation, okay? It's, it's almost a given in third-party litigation. But it is easing its way over into the comp aspect uh, because how many times, has, probably everybody has in this room where they fired somebody and they've had their iPhone on in their pocket recording everything. And we don't think about, you don't think about, oh, I, I want anything you got too, you know. Sure, we ask them the basic questions about where you were treated and so forth and your injuries and all that or um, that type stuff. But what about on, on a termination hearing or something of that nature? Uh, where they recorded it and now they've got you on 
on recording exactly what you said. Um, and and the, this electronic storage information, uh, not only in comp, but it will go into uh, termination, suspension, things of that nature. Especially if you have an appeal process as far as you can appeal the, the decision or, or the termination or whatever. But it is coming, I swear it's coming. Anybody else? Well, thank you. This was, this was just more of an information type thing that I would, I would highly recommend your organization, whether you're a third party administrator, an insurance company or self-insured to start putting in place um, that these documents are kept. And that way, not only can you show a claimant, I can show a plaintiff's attorney or that we in good faith did everything we could to preserve everything. We've got everything here and this is what we've got. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a comment, whether you're participating in person or virtually, we appreciate your flexibility and your patience in this new platform we're using today. Please have humor along with us as we work very hard to make this happen for you, bringing you your legal and your medical topics for continuing education credit. So on behalf of the board, we want to say thank you. We're going to bring back Bailey Mack to give away some more virtual door prizes. So those of you out there virtually pay attention. Hello. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize for this first poll question and he's not even in here so he can't even defend himself so I'm super happy about that. This first one is for $25 and the answer can be anything you want it to be or you can choose from one of my answers. Number one, what should Jeremy Trousdale dress as for Halloween? A kitten, a pumpkin, or a biker? Oh, Beyonce, I like that. <laughs> Morgan Dill. Dill. Morgan Dill, you won $25. Okay, so here is a $50 poll question. What is your current role in workers' compensation? Are you an adjuster, a nurse, an attorney, a doctor, or other? I'm sorry? Julie Phillips, you won $50. All right. Now, now just saying, this one might should be your favorite one, okay? Who, this is $25 only, who is your favorite board member? Jeremy Trousdale, Bailey Mack, Davida, Jessica, Cherie, Henry, who else? Christy, David, David Diane, Diane, all of the above. Uh, Wendy Phillips, you get $25 for answering that. Okay. Wendy Phillips gets 25 for answering all of the above. I saw that. All right, who was the first person? Marie Smith, 125. Marie Smith, 125. Okay. Okay, so here's a serious one. On average, how many medications is a work comp claimant utilizing? Is it one to two medications, three to four, four to five, or seven to 10? That is correct. Four to five is typical. So Tammy Williams won that. I think I said 25 on that one too. Congrats guys, we'll be back for more. Oh, wait, no, we do have a really good one. And she's coming up next, so I get to pick on her. Sean Cole is one of my favorite people and most of you know her. Where was Sean Cole born and raised? Is it Montgomery, Alabama? Locust for Alabama or Hope's Bluff? Hope's Bluff. 
the Toast Club. It's Beagle Tech USA. Oh, don't say that. She's got it. Elizabeth who? Walker. Swalker. Elizabeth Swalker. Okay, our next topic is going to be opioids, claim management, and the law. And we're going to bring to the podium Sean Cole, who holds JD from Cumberland School of Law and was admitted to the Alabama Bar in 1993. She is a shareholder in the firm of Hill Hill, Carter, Franco, Cole, and Black. Virtually 100% of Ms. Cole's practice involves workers' compensation matters. She is a frequent lecturer on varied workers' compensation matters, including specific legal issues, as well as ethics, ethical billing practices, and cost-saving measures for adjusters and employers. She also participates on the county and state level in matters involving law, student, and attorney ethics issues. Also presenting today with Sean is Donna Smith, who has a BSRN from Troy University. She owns her own company called Professional Case Management out of Wetunka, Alabama. And Zach Mack is going to speak with us and join us from Corporate Pharmacy. Sorry, I, have, I didn't tell you that. I have a <laughs> He's speaking later on Christmas too. I have some door prizes too. Except I don't have some questions. Cash. And one of the bags, guess what it has in it? And another bag besides cash has antibacterial substance. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So all you have to do is just, just can I do this to push it? Yes. Hey. That'll work. Let me do it quick. No, I'm sorry. Awesome. Okay, joining this panel is Zach Mack, who received his farm D from the University of Tennessee. He is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Corporate Pharmacy Services, a pharmacy benefits manager currently serving 150 companies in 50 states. Awesome, thank you so much. I know it's hard to hear some of the speakers, so bear with us. I know it's difficult, so hopefully there won't be a problem there as well. We're gonna try to make this as laid back and casual as we can, so you can interrupt, talk to us if you want. But we're talking about opioids. We know there's an opioid crisis, obviously. They're trying to do a lot to fix that. But one of the things we want to talk to is how do we, as lawyers, adjusters, nurses, physicians, how do we handle these things when we are dealing with claimants? Um, so one thing, obviously, they have an injury and or some sort of illness, and then we want to get immediate medical management, urgent care, medicines, um, medication, injections, therapy, or whatever, are certainly options that we want to consider. But one thing that's important, and we'll go through a little more detail about what questions the doctors need to know, but I think it's very important for them to get accurate historical information. Um, and I think it's also critical that we have nurse case management involved early in certain situations. Um, do one of y'all want to talk just about the recommended treatment, chronic pain, um, any of these issues, the medications that are there, or non-pharmacological treatments? If not, no big deal. We can skip past that. Just skip past that one. Okay, so these these will be handed out. You'll be able to access this. There are non-pharmacological treatments that are available for therapy and other things of that nature. Um, so you want to look at everything possible before we get to opioids, because there are some issues we'll talk about as we get there, whether it's therapy, relaxation, a lot of people are just stressed out. Um, they may have tension in their neck, they may be in a fight with their spouse at home, they get to work, they move wrong, and all of a sudden they have a back problem, and it may not be something that needs pharmacological treatment at all. And if any of you don't have a triage program, I would highly recommend something of that nature because you can get that first call in and it, there may be self-care so we can even skip the whole, throw them some pills at, at a problem. I will add here, and it's not on this slide, but it's very important to know who that first physician is. 
it's important to know who that first care they're getting from. Um, so you need to make sure all of your employers have a list of approved physicians, because we will sometimes see, especially in some really rural areas, people will go straight to an ER and they will give them all sorts of medicine. They'll get them started on opioids very early on, and they will make direct referrals to physicians that may not have uh, return to work issues in mind. They may be trying to help foster um, a non-working attitude, if that's the best way I could say that. I don't know what to say. There are some doctors that try to keep them out as much as possible. So there are some, There, I'm gonna let you, if you don't mind, talk a little bit about the opioid issues. I will say to me, something that's very important, and Donna, you may want to address this too. Um, so Donna does nurse case management. And if she's on one of the files, how, how would you say that medication choice is relevant to their return to work options? Well, they assess everything for, as, like we said, the truck driver, construction worker, or anybody who's just driving to work. You know, they could be in fact, I can't drive. That's, right. That's exactly and right. So people may not say a thing, and other people say, you know, this is really a fact to me, but regardless, this is a legitimate way to not be returned to work. And, and some people do use that as an excuse. So we need to be cognizant of that from the very early stages. So if you have any insureds that have safety sensitive jobs or that even have to get in their vehicle to drive to work, which most people do, they can say, I'm on drugs. I have to take this kind of medication or that. And if they are on certain medications, a doctor's not gonna make them come into work. So you need someone early on to say, can they take these medications when they get home? And what's the latest they can take it and still be able to get up and go to work the next day. So we need to be cautious of that. Now, can you talk, Zach, about some of the kind of what is an opioid and, and why do we want to look at alternatives or are there other alternatives out there? Certainly. certainly. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with opioid medications. We're, we're all familiar with the opioid crisis. Uh, the, the issues that those present for return to work is that you know, they're narcotics. They're going to put you to sleep. Make you less alert. They're going to make you a danger to the people around you. Any kind of machinery you're operating, whether it be a car or any kind of machinery at work. Uh, so I mean, it's it's a legitimate issue as far as return to work. This is not. You've got people on these medications to start. Can you hear? You can't hear. Gotcha. Okay. Let me just take this one. So, uh, you know, where was I here? Just that there are other options. Yes, there, there are plenty of other options. I think what we really need to consider is, is much like Sean said, the things that she was getting into that are alternative treatments are where you're considering the entire patient. You want to take a more holistic view of the patient's well-being, not just give them pills and get them out the door. That may be efficient, but that's it's inefficient in the long run. You're causing more problems than you're solving. Uh, by doing that. So uh, you really want to consider the entire patient situation there. You, you, the more information you have about the patient, the better. The right. Better care you can get. So I'll give one example. Let's say, for instance, you have, and I know that some people think that a lot of um, compounds are expensive, but when we had one particular truck driver, he was a log truck driver, and he was incapable of driving on the medication they gave him. So we were going to have to pay for a lengthy time for him out of work. He would have been deconditioned. He would not have been able to just up effectively do much of anything because of the medications. But we were able to buy a compounding um, cream that was able to affect the, the, situ the spot that needed the, the treatment. And we were able to keep that person at work. So when you look at the different medication costs, and I'm going to throw something in about that in a second, but when you look at the different medication costs, if you think, oh, but this is more expensive than these pills, you need to look at that holistically, as you noted, because you need to look at not only employee well-being and what it's doing to their liver that we would later have to pay for, but we also need to look at how much TTD we would have had to pay them had they not been able to return to work. But I will say, when I settle a worker's comp case and medical benefits are left open, I always try to reserve the right to choose my own pharmacy benefit manager. And that matters significantly. With One of my clients did a sampling of 59 cases 
And had they been able to use the um, price that they had negotiated with the pharmacy benefit manager instead of the fee schedule, they would have saved over $500,000. So if you can do that, they still get the same medication they're supposed to get. You're not controlling anything. It's just that you get to control where you purchase it from. So that's something else to just keep in mind when you're trying to resolve um, issues. Now, I will say the CDC has, has a lot of guidelines on this, and I would recommend when they send out or when you get the link to this presentation that you just look over that. Look at the guidelines that they have. Um, they address patient-centered clinical practices, but they really don't control what we do in our world as far as workers comp. The doctors can prescribe whatever they want, however they think. And it, you can see that in our world right now with so many physicians getting um, their, cl their clinics closed down. Some, they are specifically finding that they're bringing these patients in and they're documented, their records do not support the level of um, Oxycontin or other medications that are opioids that they're giving to these patients. So you want to make sure that you as the adjuster or the nurse on the file is really following that. We cannot really dictate what the physician does, but if we find that that physician is making choices that are not in their best interest, I think we, we owe it to that injured worker to go forward and address that. Now, Donna, where would you come in if you thought, and I know you've had to do this, if you had found a physician maybe giving too much of something or you felt like it maybe wasn't in that patient's best interest, how would you handle that? <laughs> and I would say there's another another thought that I would use. Um, we had one gentleman that was um, he was just a problem. He didn't have a lawyer yet, so but we brought him, his mother, and an ombudsman into our office, and we had an informal sort of mediation session. And we talked about opioids and because this guy was a prior drug user and he was actually on drugs at the time of the accident. And it was, it was a bad situation. A co-driver died. Um, we had a lot of issues to address with this young man and his mother was there who kind of had a little more control. We ultimately settled everything because we were tired of pumping him through pill, with pills. And we, we told him that we were going to have to ask the court have to file suit and ask the court to intervene because we didn't think he was taking the drugs the way he was supposed to. We thought it was going to cause more harm to his body. So the CDC does have some guidelines. They look at um, determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain, opioid selection, dosage duration, assessing risk and addressing harms of opioid use. They have all these guidelines, which are quite nice. But the problem is in workers' comp, our doctors really are, they control it. And so you've got to be so cautious to make sure that you have the right positions. I think that's critical. And so for instance, I'll have people call me and say, hey, can you get me a panel of physicians? Well, I know a lot of doctors, but I'm not in and out of their offices. So I'll call Donna or I'll call Lisa or I'll call somebody and say, can you help me put together a panel? Because there may be a doctor that we used six months ago or a year ago that has been great, but all of a sudden they're, they're prescribing more pills than we would like, or they're, they're ordering um, MRIs after the first visit, or they're doing a lot of other things. So it's critical that you have a physician that knows comp, that you have a physician that has that patient's best interest at heart, and that you have um, just a team approach to all of this, and that you have a pharmacy that can work with you to, to understand what medications are doing to their body. Um, anything you've got on that, Glenn? Yeah, I'd like to add, you know, a conscientious pharmacist is going to be a, an invaluable resource for you as well. I mean, mm -hmm. We know what the dosages are. We have that patient's history in front of us. We can see if there's been a change or if there's a troubling trend that would lead to problems down the road. And a pharmacist that's doing their job is going to ask that doctor. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. A pharmacist that's doing his job is going to ask the, the physician about the, these, you know, the trends that they see and, and get that explanation for you and help alert you to these kind of things. 
And I think that's important because I know you all know this, so I'm telling you something you all know probably, unless you're a new adjuster, you may not know it. But if we have a patient that's hooked, that gets hooked on these pills, um, it's gonna impact their return to work. They may never work again. So something that really should have been a minor issue has now become a PT case because we've got somebody hyped up on dope that they can't get off of. And it's our fault. If we don't have the right doctor and if we don't have the right nurse and if we don't have a pharmacy helping us work through this, if we're not proactive, looking at how this is gonna be a long-term impact on this person, it falls on us. If, they, if we cause them to be addicted, it's our problem. If we have someone whose teeth fall out because of dental issues, because of opioids, it's our problem. So something as simple as dental care, we need to look at what is their dental hygiene? Are they taking care of their teeth? If you notice that and you notice their issues, get their dental records or they may never go to a dentist, have that physician talk about the impact of opioids and monitor that pretty early on because we've got one right now that we're afraid we're gonna have to pay some very significant implants because we don't know if it's, well, I know what it is. It was poor dental hygiene, but he never went to a dentist and nobody asked the doctor to address the opioid issue. And he's been on opioids so long. And in the jurisdiction we're in, we're stuck. We're gonna pay for it. And I don't think we should, but I don't think that where we are, I don't think we're gonna have a choice because somebody who is not proactive looking at it early on. And that's another opioid issue. If they are um, addicted and they have to go to rehab, who do you think is gonna pay for that? If we got them hurt, we got them the pills, we didn't monitor it, we didn't have a doctor looking at those levels, so that's gonna be our problem as well. Um, and it impacts their overall health. And realistically, our job is to return them to work. Our, the beneficent purposes of the workers' comp statute is to return an injured worker back to some sort of gainful employment. And we've got to have this whole team of people, all of you, be a part of that. And getting them, you know, watching this opioid issue is significant. Um, so again, choose a seasoned nurse case manager, choose the right medical team, ensure that they utilize. Are you familiar with the opioid risk tool that some of the physicians use? Uh, yeah, slight. So there is an opioid risk tool. And if you know, the, let's say there's a pain doctor, a pain group that you use, they will look at this and they will look at things such as, a, is there a family history of opioid abuse? Um, is there a personal history of opioid abuse? Is there, and this is just another thing, has there been any history of sexual abuse as a child? Somehow those psychological things can make them more prone to um, have an addictive personality. Is there a history of psychological disease? All of those things play into what kind of problems we could have with an opioid issue. Um, also, we, need, we know that the state and the country, all over the country, they're watching these opioid issues. To be honest, I think a lot of it is because Medicare, Medicaid, whoever, they're tired of being shafted. So they're going in to find out what's happening. And then they're finding these physicians giving too many medications to these folks. Um, so as you mentioned, a holistic approach. And I think that's key. I think that we have to always look at their overall health. Now, Donna, when you see a patient, when you're going into a doctor's office, I know you know these doctors, you know what, you're, what you talk to them about, but if you see issues of those slurring things, do you believe as a nurse case manager that it is ethical because I think it, I mean, I think it is for you to address these things because you are looking out for the best interest of the patient, right? So if you see issues, how do you address that? Can you hear me now? Generally, they will. Some aren't. That's okay. Some are not going to. That's why you've got to know. We've got one doctor in Georgia, and I'm just going to tell you, he will not talk to the nurse. He will not talk to anyone. And we have somebody that's two years still not at MMI. It is just, and he keeps giving him medicine, giving him medicine. Um, so that's a problem. But um, so you can go to the CDC guidelines if you want to see what those prescribing guidelines are. And if you see that a physician you're dealing with is not following those guidelines, even though 
We can't necessarily dictate that they must. We can certainly go to a court at some point and say, judge, the CDC guidelines do this. We want a change of position if that injured worker won't change. I think there's a basis for arguing. All the judges know this is an opioid crisis. And even in the worst jurisdictions, they have worse problems in those more rural places in Alabama. And they may be willing to listen to us when we say we have a problem here and we need you to stop the bleeding. This injured worker may never go back to work and we owe it to him to get, or her to get them the best care. And we don't know that this is the best care. And we know the statute doesn't really address this, but we need you to help us. I personally would try doing that with an ombudsman first and see if they'll agree. Uh, but if they're a dope head and they're already hooked on it, they're not gonna listen to you. So you've got to pull out all guns and do the best you can. But I think it's our obligation to look out for that help, um, for their help. There is a prescription um, drug monitoring program through the Alabama Department of Mental Health. Um, Alabama doesn't really have a law that stipulates that uh, prescription providers have to follow the guidelines, but, but they still are monitoring. And if you have any physician that's worth his salt, you know, his weight, whatever, he's going, he or she will hopefully um, enter into drug contracts with these injured workers. And like Donna mentioned earlier, make sure there's, the stuff is either in their system at the right levels, or if it's not, they might be selling it. So anything on this? I don't know that there's much to say about it, but. Uh, yeah, sure. It's, uh, this is a, another great resource for, for prescribers and for pharmacies. This is something that every prescription that gets for opioids that is dispensed gets automatically entered into that and it can be seen by any pharmacy or prescriber in the state so they can you know refer to that before they feel something or before they write something else uh and and this is another way another tool for us to use to monitor okay and so it this lists what the physicians should do um again you can look straight at the website for this it's great information to know what your physician should be doing. So if, for instance, you are in charge of selecting your providers or helping put together a list of providers, I always believe whether it is your therapist, your nurse case manager, whether it's your physicians, I think you get them to know your industry. You make sure they know your, your, the jobs these people are going to be doing, and you have every right to interview them. And you ask them, what are your policies? What are your protocols? How do you handle this? How do you monitor the medications you're prescribing against other people? Um, I think it's very important for you to stay on top of these things. And I'm honest with you, most of the adjusters I know are overworked and they don't necessarily feel like they have time to do this. So get with your supervisors and come up with a team approach where they can, one person can work to benefit the whole group of you. Um, and I just think it's a good idea to make sure they're following these what I would call best practices. Um, okay, so the governor put together a core a team and there's an Alabama Opioid Overdose and Addiction Council. There's a 2019 annual report that's the most recent one. If anybody wants this, you can have it. Um, there is so much to this that I didn't feel like y'all would wanna hear about it or wanna go through it all today. It tells you who's on that committee. It tells you the goals. It tells you how they're trying to address workforce. And this even tells you they're measuring their goals. So for instance, let me find one of these. I'm just gonna give you this, monitoring and communication. So we talked just about monitoring. Um, it tells you what their objectives are for each of these strategies, each of these things they're trying to do what is the strategy what are they going to do what is what are their objectives so on monitoring and communication their objective one was issue a request for information to determine vendors approach to the defined needs of the um, of what they're working on um, identify funding identify participating partners and identify vendors or agencies to do what they need to accomplish and right now that is in the implementation strat, um, stages it says planning implementation and completed and right now it looks like they've only got one part of the maybe two parts of this completed but it's a long you know it's a long um, document but it's really good information to tell you kind of what they're doing i think it's important for us especially those of us dealing trying to get people back into the workforce to know what the problems are and whether the state's doing it. We have to know though, these things move slowly sometimes, but it's good to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel on some of it. 
Um, they did get, um, the year prior, they had a goal of appropriating $1.1 million to do some of these things they're trying to do, and that was passed, so that's good to know. Um, and you can find that document. You can take that one. I've only got one copy, but you can find it at the link that's on the bottom there. All right. So chronic versus acute pain. You know, I will tell you one thing. If I'm in Perry County, if I'm in Dallas County, even in Montgomery County, if I say someone is in pain management, a lots of times the judges think they're never going to work again. And so we've got to dispel that. We need to know the difference between chronic pain and acute pain. Um, do you want to talk about just any of the pain issues, either of you? You got any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that I'm sure that most of you are familiar, at least with this, uh, at least in uh, a general sense of what we're talking about, with chronic pain and acute pain. Um, acute pain, though, is, is what we're typically dealing with with the initial injury with work comp and then chronic pain is what we'll be dealing with as we go down the road with that injury. And if, the, if it's, uh, especially if it's something that's gonna require surgery or some type of procedure, that's when you'll start looking at chronic pain, which is technically classified as being pain in the last three months. Or more. So something that I think is important when you do communicate with a claimant early on and they hear chronic pain, they're gonna think that means forever. You need to tell them, you know, well, chronic pain is, they may tell you down the road, one of your medical records said there was chronic pain. That just means it's lasted three months. That doesn't mean it's lasting forever. I think we have to get them out of a disability mindset because sometimes when they hear chronic pain or pain management, they think they're done for. They can't work anymore. It is so psychological in my estimation in 27 years of doing this. I think any of y'all that have done it a long time probably see that all the time. So we've got to have in mind that you may have chronic pain, but that doesn't mean it's forever pain. And they also need to know that we all have a little bit of pain. I don't know who else woke up maybe with their neck sore or whatever, but after we're a certain age, it's just gonna happen. And so we need to get them in better lifestyle habits. I know I need some better lifestyle habits because I don't like to exercise. I don't think I've done it in about 30 years, but I'm not going to either. But these are climates, so we need to make them do something. Um, we need to keep people active. And while this is not exactly in line with what we're talking about, I think it's very important that your employers try to come up with some sort of res just restricted duty of some sort. Because the sooner we can get them off the couch, the sooner we can get them away from the television and all the commercials about hiring a lawyer, the sooner we can make them know they still matter, they're still productive, because oftentimes we have someone that hears pain management, chronic pain, and they're only getting 66 and two thirds percent of their check, even though it's not taxed, they think it's such a huge blow to their money. Um, and it's sometimes is, sometimes isn't, according to their wages, but we need to get them working. We need to get them to know that they matter because when they sit there longer, they also get depressed and they feel useless and their spouse is nagging at them and their kids are wanting to do things and they're not feeling like they can do it. And their lawyer told them that somebody's gonna video them if they go out the house. So they're doing nothing. So we've got to retrain employers to find something. And if they don't have something, then they can go to, you know, let them work at a nonprofit and pay the nonprofit to hire them and get them doing something out of the house. Uh, Sean or Shannon? Shannon, I, is Shannon in here? Yeah, so there's Shannon Cole and Sean Cole, and I get a lot of her emails from lawyers periodically. Yes. Yes. That's right. And they have some responsibility as well as the physicians, I think, to say to them that, you know, this will get better, but you don't need this medication anymore. You're past that point, and therapy, there's other ways for you to concentrate. Well, I think that's a huge, I think that's very important. And I think that that's where, again, a nurse can come in. You know, you may have someone that is, the, the, they feel like that there's nothing else that they can do. They feel like they're in pain. They don't know there's anything else. Well, we can get a nurse to go into that position and say, hey, 
you know, you, you release them, but they're still having some pain. Give them some suggestions, give them some hope. Sometimes it's just hope. It's just hope that I'm going to get better. Um, and I think that's a very valid point. So we need to make sure we do that. Engage the physicians that understand our ultimate goals. And I know they're busy and I know you're busy, but I think that those cases that start out as just a small little something can turn huge if we don't do those things. Anybody else? I was just for a period of time. That's great. Well, I think that's huge and I think that's important and that's something that we need to make sure our physicians know and our nurses work with the physicians if they don't. Many of you have done this long enough that you know your doctors and you can pick up the phone and call their work comp coordinator. And if they don't have a work comp coordinator, get the nurse to go in and say, here are problems we've seen. I had someone recently tell me that they were not happy with the local op med doctor. And there's really only one in that area. And they were having issues. And I said, don't write him off. He's the only one there in that area. I'm telling you, he is the only one. Set up a meeting with him by Zoom or by phone and tell him your issues. Tell him you don't want an MRI after every strain. Tell him you don't want whatever, but don't offend him. Ask him why. Find out, find out whatever there is, but it's a great doctor. It's just they're having a few issues. And I think you've got to get a nurse or the adjuster in there to find out what that is if it's a doctor you've tr entrusted or if it's a doctor you've got existing claims with because they've got them forever and you want to keep that line of communication open and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do we've talked about pain what it is um and it's highly subjective and and what's really unfortunate in Alabama under the law, you know, we can have a doctor that says return to work full duty, don't believe their complaints of pain, can't understand where the pain is coming from, um, I'm, their FCE was invalid, I'm returning them to work full duty, uh, but then they still prescribe them opioids. And then I'm going to try to convince a judge that they can return to work full duty, they failed their FCE because they didn't try to do anything, their pain complaints are subjective, but by the way, they're still on open. We've got to watch that and realize that that shouldn't happen. If the if the doctor doesn't believe them, we don't still need to be having the doctor give them opioids. I think that's important because the judge is not going to believe us and it's all factually based. Um, so government policy, they hands off on workers' comp, that doesn't matter. Um, all these are things that I think are, you know, employers can't dictate to an employee that about medical treatment, if a doctor says this medical treatment is necessary and the um, patient doesn't want it, we can't force them to have it. We, you know, I will say on medication issues, on physician recommended things that are not invasive like surgery, if they're not doing it, I would always send a letter that says non-compliance. You know, we're gonna give you a window of time. We believe you're not being compliant and the physician needs to state that, I believe. And so we may have the nurse go talk to the doctor and say, he's missed therapy six times in a row now and the opioids are not in his system or they're more in his system and have that physician address non-compliance issues and say, I'm gonna give them a window. I'm, some of you can totally disagree with me and that's fine. I don't believe in cutting their check off immediately if they miss an appointment. And I don't believe in cutting their check off immediately if they've missed two appointments and done something wrong over the course of a few weeks because they're gonna need the money, they're not at MMI and you're gonna get sued. So I think you're better off to warn them, to discuss it with them because otherwise you're just gonna hire a lawyer, the judge is gonna make you start it back and then you're gonna be in a worse place because they're gonna hate you. And I think sometimes it's just massaging that relationship with that claimant saying, hey, what's wrong? Why didn't you show up? Somebody wanted to cut a check off on someone the other day and we found out the husband had COVID. Um, I said, don't cut the check off. Let's figure out what happened. Husband had COVID, she couldn't go anywhere. She didn't call. That was shame on her, but it didn't matter. She couldn't go on anywhere. So I'm glad they didn't cut it off because we would have got the lawsuit. Um, do y'all have anything on that, on just um, non-compliance or 
dealing with the treating physician on any of these issues? Nothing in particular? Well, no. I want to purchase. That makes sense. All right. So next, we've talked about these first things clearly, but we don't need to deal with those first two topics. But an employee's right to compensation may be suspended for refusing to accept medical services. If we find what I'm going to give you an example of a functional capacity evaluation. I have attorneys argue, well, they don't have to do an FCE. It's not medical treatment. So I just get the doctor to say the FCE is important to us to ascertain what they can do and what the future medical treatment will be. I need to know their functional limitations for medical purposes, not just for you to value a case. So we need to make sure that's part of the medical treatment regimen, not just an evaluation tool for settling a case. So make sure that if those things don't occur, if they're not doing right, that that's documented. And then you may have to file a lawsuit if it's not in litigation and say court address this medical non-compliance issue. If it's a smoking cessation thing and they're hyped up, laid up on their sofa, taking their opioids and they're smoking and they're not gonna quit and they can't get their surgery and you drug this out for nine months because the doctor won't do surgery until they quit smoking, you're gonna have to have a court say, you're medically non-compliant and see if you can get them put it non-surgical MMI um, or it's gonna drag on forever. So let's see. Um, Workers comp, case managers, pre-certification utilization review. Um, Y'all know why you have to do pre-cert. I don't think we really have to talk about that, but I think it's important to know that while we can't dictate what medications they give, um, you need to approve those things fast. If you have questions, have your nurse ask the doctor, like we said, but I have had more lawsuits lately filed because the medications are not approved with the pharmacy and they're calling me. I don't bill my adjusters for it because I get so many of these calls, y'all would go broke. I mean, it's just, somebody just needs to say, okay, they can have it. The authorized treating physician prescribed Norco or prescribed whatever, tramadol. Um, and they're going back and forth to the pharmacy two and three times because they're not going to pick up the phone and call about it. They're going to drive there. Um, so make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. And if you have a problem with it, go through the proper channels. Don't just not approve it because you're going to have problems. And that's just pre-certification process. Y'all know how that works. I don't want to go through that. The common narcotics. The, do y'all know about all the drugs? I mean, y'all know about the drugs, right? You know what they are, what they do. You don't need to hear us say that. Okay. I will say some of these things are generic. And I believe that a lot of claimants think that they're getting the shaft if you give them generics. So early on, you may want to say there are generics and there are name brands. They all do the same thing. If you have any questions, you can ask your doctors. You may get some generic drugs, but it's the same basic thing. So they don't just do it early on. Just let them know early on and be their buddy and get them their mileage checks on time so they don't fight you over every little thing. Um, I think we've done enough on the product. This is, um, if you, any of you are familiar with NCCI, the rating organization, if you go to their website, they did a study on um, opioids and it's not a brand new study, but it's still got some really good information. Are you familiar with any of that? I've seen it. You've seen it? Okay, y'all wouldn't have to deal with that. You wouldn't have to ever deal with it. Um, but it's interesting because apparently workers comp is doing better than the national trend for opioid issues and problems. But um, th there's just a lot of interesting data in there to see where there are still some serious problems. And I think that if any of you understand claims and costs, you see that the bulk of our cost for any claims tends to be medications. Don't y'all think that? And we found, like, let's say you've got a claim and you want to do um, an MSA. If you can get with your physician, get with your pharmacy, get with your nurse case manager and work together to get them on a better regimen of medication and get them off of some of these opioids and wait and price that a few months down the road, you're gonna get a much better price on an MSA than if you just 
throw it out there for pricing uh, while they're still on too many of these pills. If it's a short, you know they're gonna never work again. You know you wanna settle the case. You know they're disabled for life. If you can start early with a medication regimen plan, even if it takes a life care plan or whatever else, but really keep in mind the cost of those opioids, you will save a lot of money and it's gonna be better for that injured worker because the longer they stay on these opioids, if they get a life care plan or they get some pricing and they see certain medications and then someone wants to change it, they're not gonna like it. So try to have a plan early on where you wean them off. Like you said, Donna, I think you said, you know, these orthopedics will say for a window of time they get it. But do you still see some drag it out longer? A few? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's important. You know, that's important. You need to, and not only do you need to know that, you need to tell the other people you work with. We have a problem with this physician over prescribing. Um, and again, it's on us. These, most of these claimants, well, I have one that's had seven injuries right now, but most of the claimants have not had an injury before. They may not understand understand the system. They may not know how it works. They may be scared. They may think opioids are the only thing that works for me. You may offer them some kind of cream and they may think that you're crazy. Um, do you ever do patient education on any of those things as a pharmacist? Quite often, quite often. And we're, we're constantly involved in monitoring our patients and the amount of opioids that they're using. I mean, this is something that's been front and center of everyone's mind now for some time. Uh, so we definitely, we definitely uh, interact with patients on a regular basis to try to talk about alternative therapies, compounds, all sorts of things. I mean, there, you want, when you're dealing with, with work comp patients in, in particular, you want to have every tool in the toolbox available. And, and really a lot of what you're saying too just boils down to communication between all the members that are involved in the patient. I think that's important. Um, one other thing that's not on here either, but I think it's really, important to not be prideful. If somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I don't care if I've been doing this for 27 years. I can call Mike Cody in, I can call Jeannie Walston, I can call somebody and say, have y'all dealt with this issue? It may be an adjuster issue. If I'm dealing with an adjuster, I'm not going to be an idiot and act like I know something. I'm going to say, oh, Davida, I don't know what to do about this. What are your thoughts on it? And Davida may say, oh, I don't know. Let's see if our pharmacist can help us answer the question. I think too many people have a little bit of pride and they're afraid that they are supposed to know it all. And we all do different parts. I am not a nurse. I am not a pharmacist. I am not an adjuster. I'm not a broker. I'm not, I'm not a lot of, I'm not an investigator. I know my piece, but we're a team. And I think it's very important to understand that there is someone that's a lot more knowledgeable about a lot of the pieces of these things. And we've got to work with this. I can call a pharmacist and get a much better idea about what something's gonna do to that patient than I'm ever gonna know or a physician. I mean, I've called a physician in the middle of a mediation. I texted one particular doctor in Montgomery and said, I'm in a mediation and my client is with me and we are looking at your records. You rarely say someone can't return to some sort of work. Do you feel comfortable telling me, talking to me about it? And he said, sure, call me. So I called and we were able to talk through it. And he said, I don't think he's gonna go back to work. And it was, a, it was really very helpful to us. Um, I could have looked at the four corners of a piece of paper and made something out of it. But if they had deposed him, we would have gotten something a lot different than we would have thought. So I think we need to use, like you said, all the tools in the toolbox that we can. Um, the rest of these, just common narcotics. You, know, you all probably know those. I will say, I don't know if you all saw this recently, but the Oxycontin maker pled guilty to federal criminal charges paying $8 billion and they're gonna close their company um, because they said that basically they purposefully contributed to this problem. Um, so we just wanna be cautious. Again, we can't control. So this part of this was the law. We can't control what those doctors prescribe, but it is our job to make sure if we see something harmful that we try to step away from that as much as possible. Does that answer questions? Anybody have any questions from us? We're done. Oh, except I've got prizes. Except I don't have questions. Do we have any way to like come up with some question? Come on, somebody. Where does Zach work? Where does Zach work? Anybody? Any? There you go. Okay, you you can win a prize. Winner. You want the light bulb or the antibacterial? <laughs> 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 
parking lot. All right. The life's all worth more than Where does Donna <laughs> Smith live? Cash or antibacterial stuff and the cat. Okay. Um, where do our AV people today go to college? No, not in Montgomery. I mean, not in Birmingham. It's in Savannah. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Um, who is the director of the Alabama Department of Labor Workers' Comp Division? Who said that first? Somebody back there. You win the prize. Woo -woo. Here's some cash for you. <laughs> and some other stuff. Okay. Who was the Alabama Department of Labor Workers' Comp Division director before Steve Garrett? Nope. Scotty was before. Well, y'all already won. <laughs> okay. So, did you say it? Who said it? It's not a, okay, yeah, yay, we're done. <laughs> Thank y'all. Does anybody want this stuff from the department? I mean, from KIV on opioids? Anyone interested? Not a good call. No. <laughs> The baby's got to go yours if you want. Oh, yeah, I'm going to. Uh, we want to thank Donna and Zach and Sean for a very interesting presentation. And before we go uh, any, any further, I want to mention for those of you in the room, there is a fishbowl at this table. Shannon's holding it up. Please drop a business card in this bowl because that's how we're going to give those of you here door prizes. If you don't have a business card, borrow one from someone and write your name and your phone number and your email address on the back of it. So at some point today, go ahead and do that. When are we gonna draw? At the end of the day or We're going to draw, we're going to have the first drawing for those of you in the room right after lunch. When, we're going to have several drawings. Put your card in that bowl as quickly as possible, but it won't be before uh, the end of this next presentation. So we're now going to bring to the podium Michael Cohan. He's going to talk with you all about verifying prior workers' comp claims. Mike Cohan is a 1986 graduate of the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina, where he obtained a BS in business administration. Mr. Cohan graduated from the Cumberland School of Law, obtaining his JD in 1983 and has since practiced throughout Alabama and Georgia. Mr. Cohan represents individuals, governmental agencies, corporations, insurance companies, and workers' compensation. Uh, he, he handles such practice, or his practice includes employment issues, workers' compensation, retaliatory discharge, personal injury, uh, contract litigation, products liability, bad faith, and fraud. Mr. Cohan is a graduate of Leadership Montgomery and is a veteran, having served 11 years in the United States Army Reserves, JAG Corps. Mr. Cohan lives in Auburn, Alabama with his wife and two children. We're gonna now bring Michael Cohan to the stage. Morning, afternoon. I'm I'm early, so y'all stretch for just a second while we have a uh, technical issue up here. Well, luckily this isn't an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just gotta get it all. Do what? 
Oh, I know. Yeah. Believe me. I, I will, believe me, I will get y'all out of here early. So I always love being the speaker right before lunch. on the computer that's perfect. that's perfect yeah i know what and am i doing you can use this to go forward and back forward back mm -hmm. all right good day. Good, that work? We good? All right. Sorry about that. I was asked to talk to you about verification of workers' compensation claims. Uh, and, and as I understand, that's been a, a topic that's been asked about in the past and, and was suggested as a topic for this year. Uh, prior to talking about actually verifying workers' compensation claims or obtaining that kind of information, I kind of wanted to go through some of the reasons why you would uh, why you want this information in a workers' compensation setting. Some of the things that we're gonna talk about uh, briefly are uh, as on the screen, apportionment of disability, pre-existing conditions, uh, the claimant's history of claims and prior litigation, and then prior sworn testimony, uh, if we can obtain that kind of information as well. Uh, what's apportionment? This is actually in the Workers' Compensation Act, and this is a good example of how uh, ridiculous uh, the Workers' Compensation Act reads. Uh, when you look at it, uh, and I'll read it, uh, y'all can read it with me, but this is, this is the apportionment statute. If an employee has a permanent disability or has previously sustained another injury that, than that in which the employee received a subsequent permanent injury by accident, as is specified in this section defining permanent injury, the employee shall be entitled to compensation only for the disability or injury that would have resulted from the latter accident if the early disability or injury had not existed. Crystal clear, right? It's a mess. Uh, what this means simply is this, if you've got a, a employee or a claimant who has had a prior finding of a disability and prior finding of a disability is, is not defined, but some examples are they've actually had a prior workers' compensation claim, maybe adjudicated through a court and there's been a finding of disability or they've got an impairment rating. It doesn't have to always be a workers' compensation claim. It could be a car wreck case. It could be some sort of other uh, injury case or injury claim where there has been some sort of finding of disability. Uh, I would argue that it doesn't even have to be a medical disability. It can be a vocational disability. It can be a social security finding, those sort of things. If they have that and they've now come uh, to, to the present case and they're claiming a disability greater than that amount, in theory, the apportionment statute says that you should reduce the, the amount of disability that we currently have by the prior disability. So in other words, you've got a 50% disability, but they have a prior 25, then the court or the finer fact should actually assign them only the 25% that they can assign to this particular injury. That sounds good. And if you actually read the statute, it even, it, it says they shall do that. It, it's, there's no discretion there. Well, as with every other case uh, or every other situation in the workers' compensation act, the court's got a hold of it. And it now is, they can do that. The judge can do that. So it's very discretionary, which is probably why I guarantee nobody in this room has ever dealt with this or even had this happen successfully, but it's still something to argue. Why don't we see this? Um, because generally it's considered that if an employee is working at their job at the time they're injured, then they don't have a former disability or they couldn't do the job that they're doing now. The times when I think this is applicable, or at least you can have a decent argument is when you've got the employee working possibly at the same job uh, or the same employer rather. Uh, I do some work for, for Walmart and we oftentimes will have somebody who has been injured. They go through their workers' compensation claim. They have a disability. They have certain restrictions and we put them back to work at a job, not what they were doing at the time of their injury. 
within those restrictions and in line with what the doctors told them they can't, can and cannot do. They may get hurt again. That's a situation where maybe the apportionment statute could apply, where you have somebody in the same employment doing a, a limited job and now they've got a new uh, disability. The reason I think that holds more water than, than another case is it, it's very difficult to go back to a prior employer, a different employer, and find out exactly what they were or were not doing based on that prior disability. So you're li most likely not going to convince the finer fact that the current disability should be reduced based on the apportionment stage. In any event, it's still something to argue about. It's, I've never had a judge uh, apportion a disability, but it is something to argue, to hopefully in their mind, reduce the disability. But again, that that's something, if we can find out uh, prior claims, this is something that can apply to. Uh, other things uh, that you want to find prior workers' comp claim, compensation claims about are pre-existing conditions. We're very familiar with pre-existing conditions, and those of us who practice in this field have always gotten the phone call from the adjuster saying, hey, uh, got an injury, but the guy's got all these pre-existing conditions. Can I deny the claim? Of course you cannot deny the claim. Uh, you take them as you get them. Uh, the practical rule is pre-existing pre -existing conditions don't have any bearing on your workers' compensation claim. Uh, and that's, it's hard to accept when you have somebody, as, as I put up here, five prior back fusions and they get hurt on your, on your job. What about the pre-existing conditions? Well, pre-existing conditions don't have any bearing on whether or not you can deny the claim or how you should handle the claim. These are some terms you may have heard of, the eggshell plaintiff, you take them as you get them. They're deemed to be in perfect working order when they came to your employment or your insurance employment. Uh, if, you, if you're sitting in a deposition with a plaintiff, if the plaintiff attorney asks any questions of their client, it's gonna be the one that's up here now. Were you able to do your job without issues or without restrictions at the time you're at? Of course, they say, yes. Well, it's a baseline. There's zero. It doesn't matter about the five prior fusions. They were doing their job on that day. But we still want to know about the prior workers' compensation claims. Even though we can't deny the claim, we can't treat the claim any differently the way we can, we still want to know about it. And why? You can still negate the, the exposure of your claim. If you can show that this person has had five prior fusions, for example, you're going to be able to hopefully negate the judges wanting to pop you with the entire PTD, whatever the, the disability may be. Uh, you can show a pattern of complaints and claims that this person has had. It may uh, affect the, the believability of that claimant. If you can show, you know, this is what they do for a living. They bring claims, they bring lawsuits, uh, they get hurt all the time. Most importantly, I think that when you, when you find this information of prior claims, uh, especially prior workers' compensation claims. If you're sitting down with the doctor or you're deposing the doctor and you can show the doctor that these things occurred, that can really have a bearing on your claim. Oftentimes when the doctors assign impairment ratings, they're not looking at this specific accident that you're dealing with. They're looking at the overall condition of the, the claim. Similarly, with a vocational evaluation, it's the same thing. When they sit down and they have a vocational assessment, they're looking at the overall condition of this claim. If you can sit down and show, hey, I found five prior workers' compensation claims and they had this, 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 and this, doctor, vocational expert, can you can you say that this, this finding that you have today is just because of the accident that we hear about today? Well, oftentimes they're gonna say, well, no, this is an overall condition. And then you can work with them and see if you can't reduce that finding that they have today of the impairment or the vocational disability to limit it, hopefully just to your injury. And it may negate that. Similarly, if you can argue that to the fact finder, to the judge, you may be able to reduce their mindset of, hey, this is all because of your accident. I can show you five other workers' compensation claims they've had. It's, you know, the person may be permanently totally disabled, but it's not because of us. It's a combination of all of those. And you may be able to negate a bad case. Another reason you want to find prior workers' compensation claims is to get a history of their claims and hopefully prior testimony that they've given. If you, can, if you can find out about prior claims, some of those claims have actually been in litigation. If they've been in litigation, they've probably given a deposition. They've probably answered sworn interrogatory answers. Those are helpful things to have with regard to the current claim that you have. Um, you can show inconsistencies in their stories. 
um, it, can, it can lead you down a rabbit trail of, hey, we've got this lawsuit, which then talks about this lawsuit, which talks about this injury, which talks about this one. Uh, and again, think, think beyond just workers' comp. You're not just looking for prior workers' comp claims, you're looking for prior claims. Uh, oftentimes, they're automobile accidents. Uh, there are their disability claims of a non-workers' comp nature. All right, here's what we, what we wanted to know. How do we find out about these prior workers' compensation claims? I've put up here, and this is not, this is not limited. Uh, these are the ones I thought of, and I'm sure everybody else can come up with some more. But ISO reports, those of you who are adjusters, I guess know what ISO reports are. Uh, those are extremely helpful to us. They usually come at the very beginning with a claims file. It gives us an immediate indication of whether this person has a history of claims and should we look forward. Further, uh, if it's in litigation, it gives us an opportunity to possibly subpoena other insurers, other employers, other parties, uh, look for other lawsuits, that sort of thing. It's a, it's a good roadmap that we get from the very beginning that you all provide to us. Uh, background checks. Uh, background checks oftentimes can be done in-house. I know that those folks that do surveillance offer those services quite often where they can run background checks. Similarly to the ISO reports, it'll give you a nice rundown of, of what this person has or has not done in the past. And you can then take it further. And again, especially if it's in litigation, you have the opportunity to subpoena and, and get this information. Alicorp, uh, the lawyers know what this is and, and many of you may know what it is too, but Alabama, surprisingly, Alabama is in the forefront of online court records. Uh, years ago, uh, they developed a system where all court files, uh, criminal, civil, domestic, can't think what else, just about everything that is in a state court in Alabama can be found online through Alicor. It's a great source of information and you can search by name, you can search by social, you can search by type of case, you can search by jurisdiction, or you can go statewide. One of the first things I do when I get a new file is I go to Alicor and I put that person's name in there. It's amazing what as was out there, the number of lawsuits that are out there, the number of criminal matters, down to traffic tickets are out there. Uh, again, it is, a, it is a starting block to, to then go find more information. I will, this caveat, make sure that the person who you think you have is the person you have. Uh, oftentimes it has a date of birth and social next to it. You can cross-reference. When Years and years and years ago, when I was a lot younger, I went into a deposition of a plaintiff and I had a stack. And I thought, I got this guy. He's got, he's got five lawsuits. He's got 25 criminal actions. I'm going to bust his butt. And I get in there and I'm going through him and I'm going through him. He's like, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. And finally, he stops me about halfway through and he goes, sir, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you that. That's my daddy. And, you know, bless his heart. I thought I had him. He was clean as a whistle. His daddy, on the other hand, was problem child. So make sure you've got the person you think you got. Uh, other things, other ways to find prior claims, the employment files of, of your insurance, uh, go through those, uh, dig through those and see if they've reported things in the past. They certainly have reported prior employers. Again, it is a jump start to go find more information. Look at the, uh, the especially the initial application oftentimes will give you some information about maybe some prior employers, prior claims, limitations on their ability to do things. Let, similarly, your own insurance files uh, within your own company. Um, sometimes you have the claimant appears more than once with your company. Uh, make sure you dig back further than just the initial claim that you've got. And you may find that they've had more claims just with you. Uh, medical records, dig through the medical records. Uh, medical records for the current claim will lead you to the doctor before and the doctor before and the doctor before. And if you dig back far enough, you'll find out Oh, they had another injury, another claim, another lawsuit. Facebook and Google. Uh, those of you who are younger are much better at this than me, except Jack. Uh, but go in there and put their name in there. It's amazing what you will find, especially with Facebook. As y'all know, people like to talk about themselves. They like to tell their stories. They'll tell their stories about their injuries. They'll tell their stories about their lawsuits. They'll tell their stories about their claims. Uh, that's a wealth of information and even just just flat out Google that person and you'll be amazed what you can find. And then of course in discovery, uh, if it's in litigation, you have the opportunity to subpoena all these folks. You have subpoenas of prior employers, you can subpoena 
prior insurers. Uh, in some states, you can obtain prior workers' compensation claims. Um, the state of Alabama, as I understand, is not so easy. Uh, but am I right, Steve? Very difficult to get any information out of the state of Alabama. For those of you online, Steve Garrett has told us that you have to have the claimant's approval to obtain what information they have with regard to prior uh, claims. Uh, a subpoena is not going to cut it. A simple request to Steve, hey, would you send me this? This is not going to cut it. So you've got to you've got to get the claimant's approval or a release of some sort to get the state. Different states have different rules along those lines. Georgia, I think, is a little bit easier to get information. I think they'll respond to a subpoena. Uh, but those are sources of information. And, and think going back to Alicourt, where I said, you know, you can find anything about anybody's workers' compensation claim or prior suits on Alicourt. That's true if it was in litigation. When claims are settled through the ombudsman program through the state of Alabama, those things don't show up on Alicourt. That's when you got to go to Steve, and Steve will give it to you. Uh, <laughs> right, Steve? That's right. And, and what he what he clarified was that if, if a judge approves a settlement, it would show up in Alicourt. If an ombudsman approves it, it's not in Alicourt. It's not in the court system. So it's only with the state of Alabama that has that. So you're going to have to go back to uh, getting a signed release uh, for that information from the state. I don't know if anybody else has got any other ideas about how to get information, things that they've, they've utilized to, to obtain prior workers' compensation claims, or, or if you have any questions along those lines. I'm going to repeat that for the people online I, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong about what, what I'm hearing. You're talking about releases that are obtained early on in a claim by the insurer. Uh, oftentimes they, they're used for medical records and that sort of thing, but they may be blanket releases that the claimant signed uh, long before there's any litigation or anything like that. And I think your question is how can you use that release beyond that point? Typical lawyer answer, it depends. Uh, it, it really depends on who you're presenting that to. It's it. Some will say yes, some will say no. I'm gonna bet Steve is gonna say no. He wants more current release and he wants one probably that's more directed towards exactly what you're asking for. Um, you you can be as specific as you want, or you can be as vague as you want, and, and you know it, it's sort of a double-edged sword. If you're too specific, then Steve's gonna say, well, that doesn't apply to me. You're asking for medical records, and yet you're asking for a claim history over here. Uh, if it's too broad, they may say the same thing. Well, this is too broad. I need you to be more specific. So again, it depends. It really, but look, try to use it. Um, I, I have I've done that before too. When it's not in litigation, or if it's in litigation, and possibly I'm trying to get. Uh, for those of y'all know, if you're trying to get medical records out of state, it's very very difficult. You got to jump through a lot of hoops in in litigation. If I'm trying to get records from uh, Houston Clinic in Columbus, and my case is in Alabama, that's that's not an easy task to do. So oftentimes what I will do is try to use the release that I got with the claims file and send that over there and see if that will work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it depends on the timing of it. Again, it depends on the wording and depends on the recipient as to whether or not they want to accept it or not. They're not required. I mean, they, they, can, you know, they can make you jump through as many hoops as they really want to. I mean, that's... But, they, but it's a good idea to try to utilize that. Anybody? Yes, sir. Coach Stephen, the states, we have a medical record. And again, I'm over. I'm over. We don't have specific. We have specific compensation records. Florida and all the other 
again, for the folks online, what, what Steve just said is that the records that they maintain uh, are limited to administrative records, I guess, first reports of injury and those, and those sort of thing and payment histories and I guess that sort of thing, but not medical records. So if you ask, uh, if you ask Steve for the, the records and you give him a release, you're not going to get more than that. And if your release, correct me if I'm wrong, if your release simply says, I want medical records, Steve's response is going to be, I don't have those. Um, so you need to, if you're, if you're looking for files from the state, uh, and that applies to other, other situations where you may be looking for a specific item or, or you don't know what they specifically have, some of your releases are not going to apply. Um, and, and as Steve said, other states are differently. Georgia, for, as he said, has a, has a full file, so to speak. Uh, if, you, if you ask for their files, you're going to get everything. You're going to get the doctor's records. You're going to get the claims uh, information. You're going to get the first reports and those sort of things. Anyone else? All right, I've got, um, I don't want to hold y'all because it's, it's, getting, it's getting to lunchtime. All right, we're gonna do a, well, I was gonna, I'm locked up here. Never mind, I got it. All right, we're gonna have a quiz. On here is my cell phone number. As I go through the quiz questions, when they're all done, not each individual question, you need to text me the answer to each one of the questions with your name. So I'm an adjuster. Question one, answer, question two, answer, question three, answer, et cetera, okay? First ones win, first ones I get correct, win. We're clear? All right, it's gonna take a lot of thought, all right? What year was the current Alabama workers' compensation law enacted? All right, write them down because then you're gonna text, you're gonna text them later, okay? Everybody got that? What's a valid defense to a worker's compensation claim? Didn't see you fall, don't really like you. You were drunk at the time of your accident and your intoxication was the sole cause of your accident and injury. Or my lawyer said, deny the claim and send me the file to review. How much is the current cap on weekly PPD? Don't be fooled by B. What's the correct TTD for an average weekly wage of $1,800? This one's a little tricky. I mean, national championships is Alabama Crimson Pipe. Come on, come on, come on. It's a trick question. But all right, to be fair, to be fair, I mean, national championships is Auburn. All right, give me your answers. Some of y'all send me one answers. I need all your answers. All right, I'm cutting you off. It's sad that these aren't all correct, but you may have noticed a pattern. They were all C, because I can't keep up with them. All right, if, you, if you're here, if you're here, holler, if you did it remotely, send me another text and tell me how to get you your prize. Tracy Stallings. I should call out the people that got these wrong. <laughs> I can't find another full right answer. Thank you. Good job. Um, wow. <laughs> wow. All right. Who's who's two oh five three oh six four three zero four? You won. Good. 
story. You're welcome. Don't make me beat Army. Hey, yeah. Um, I'm gonna give this one three three four five four nine two one nine four. All right, that was a gift. That was a gift. You only answered one question, but it was right. All right, this wasn't one hundred percent, but I'd like to go dogs. Six seven eight three one three eight zero three nine. That must be an online person. Who put go dogs? Oh, I see it. I see it. Oh. All right, tell us you won. Only because you said go dogs. Yeah. All right. Who who's gonna win the uh, Alabama Mississippi State game this week? Okay. Who said it? Who said it broke? Right. Two two over there. Whoever said it over that table. Oh, sorry. Who's gonna win the Auburn game? Another one that table over there. Somebody else say Auburn over there? Was it a was it a backwards pass in the Arkansas game? Back. In the back. I heard it in the back. All right, that's all I got. Anybody got any questions, comments? Enjoy lunch. Thank y'all. Thank you, Mike. So we're going to uh, break for about 30, well, really about 45 minutes. Um, be back here by 1 o'clock. We are going to have a drawing when you first come back, so be sure you put a business card in the fishbowl. And there's a plated lunch where we had breakfast this morning across the hall. Oh, I can just play off. I know, I gotta share the screen still.
Let me turn the screen for a second. Really, if I unmute this. Oh, no, it is unmuted. Never mind.
<laughs> but you know, hey, we live when we learn. Thank you. Long as things on the screen, long as you get sound, that's all you need. You can always make it to a meeting. You got five points on the screen, microphone, down to the left. So, what did he do? So, fight with, like, like, when you're at a red light, All right, I see you. Okay, if you just if you want to mute yourself.
always want to do is kind of go, okay, give a lot of you know, when you pass them on. I said, I'll come in and let you change the bag, and you got to put it in whatever. So, they're, they're getting, I haven't gotten a call, so I'm like, we have one lady. No, it's got to be close. I'm not calling the heart. If you're inside the heart, you can forget that. That's my last of myself. Get the heart. It says microphone didn't work. Oh. It's actually too bad the first two bad. But it's just kind of clear. Yeah, that would be something. Thank you. 
Hello. Hey, Mike. and Judge York are both on. Okay. Judge Patton, not yet. Uh, let me check. Let's see. Hello. Okay, I've got people on Zoom can hear us. Yeah, we're playing with you. Hello, people on Zoom.
are renovating our courthouse. <laughs> hear that. <laughs> I don't know if we hours. have progress. <laughs> Where are you? In Montgomery, and it's never been renovated. Um, of course, this may not have been the best timing because now we're sharing courtrooms, but- uh, oh, wow. That's tough. They said six months at first for each floor, and now it's nine, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Did y'all get uh, much uh, impact from the storm last night? You know, we really did. My power is still out at my house. Um, and you know, I left the family behind in the dark, but, uh, but a lot of trees taken out. Uh, I live in an older neighborhood, so of course a lot of those old trees came down. And, um, and you know, we're fortunate that nothing, we didn't have anything damaged, which we're thankful for. Amen. How about in Birmingham, Judge? We all okay? Um, I fared well. There, are, There's definitely trees, branches down, um, and a couple, oh, a lot of people actually that I spoke with this morning lost power, but I didn't have any issues. Um, my dog even slept through the storm, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. I don't, I, I'm not sure what that says about his ability to alert me. <laughs> to danger, but <laughs> yeah, you might want to check that out. Uh, what about Mobile, bad weather there? Yeah, we took a pretty good hit last night. It was uh, it was real, really different. We didn't think it was going to be nearly the impact that it did. The good thing was it was moving so fast. So I think that helped us with regard to trees coming down. Sadly, we took a lot more uh, more of a hit because of the uh, number of trees that went down. I just but, yeah. uh, been hit a couple of times. Uh, pardon me. You all have been hit a couple of times this season. We have, yeah, but you know they haven't been big, you know. It, Anything that's not a category three or above, we consider that a blessing. Really we'll we'll take those so I'm not gonna yeah. be able to hear. In order for me to moderate, I gotta hear what they're saying. Hey, can one can one of the panelists say something, please? We can hear you. Okay, I just need to make sure you guys are loud enough. It, does it sound okay on your end? You got a little bit of an echo, but we can hear you. <laughs> It should be good. Yeah, I, I would prefer to have someone nearby. <laughs> okay, thanks. Good afternoon, judges. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, can you see me? Yes. Great. Great. I, I can see you as well. This is my first Zoom conferencing where you can act where I had to wear pants. <laughs> <laughs> We're, uh, you can't see the room. Uh, they're all shuffling in uh, from lunch right across the hall. So they're on their way in right now. Uh, there was a bit of a delay getting the lunch out. So I apologize to you judges, but uh, I'll, we'll probably still have you out a little early uh, as I was telling Judge York, this is a great topic, but I don't know that it's a topic that's gonna take a full 60 minutes, if you know what I mean. <laughs> thank, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's funny, the evolution, I'm, I'm really talking to you judges right now while they're coming in, the evolution of this panel coming together and, and how we were going to do it. Uh, it. At first, it was a, a hybrid panel, and then it was two judges were going to be here, then one judge, and then we had a hurricane, and then we had a judge without internet, but somehow we've all made it. So, so thank you. Uh, I think this is going to be a good topic. I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we only have about half the room, but this is a hybrid audience as well. We've got about 50 people in the audience, whereas normally we'd have closer to 250. And then, uh, but we still have another 180 participating virtually, just like you are. So they can all see you, and I, I think they can see me as well. Uh, why don't I just go ahead and get started for? Oh, thank you. I've just. This next speaker, I'll just go ahead and do the introductions. Thanks, Henry. Um, this next moderator uh, needs no introduction because it's me, and I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a Birmingham attorney. My name's Mike Fish. I, I know most of the people in the audience, maybe not all of you virtually, uh, but I'm, I'm honored to be here and moderate this panel. For uh, It's a judge panel. We've got three great judges to discuss pro se plaintiffs. Pro se is Latin for uh, basically uh, handling it yourself. That's not the direct definition, but uh, 
I didn't do great in Latin, so that, bear with me on that. It's, if you represent yourself as a plaintiff, and that's something that our judges have to deal with, that's certainly something that defense lawyers have to deal with, and, and even more so with adjusters, they, they deal with that more than anyone else. So um, without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panel of judges. Um, first, I've got the honorable, and this is in no order, particular order, uh, it's in the order that was handed to me. Uh, the Honorable Javon Patton. She was elected to the 10th Judicial Circuit Court of Alabama, which is right here in Birmingham, Jefferson County. Uh, prior to that, she served as Assistant City Attorney in Birmingham and in the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office. Uh, she is also, uh, she's also been in the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. She is the direct Director of the Liturgical Dance Ministry at Sixth Avenue Baptist Church she volunteers for Sisters Inspiring Sisters Through the Arts, social event co-chair with the Alabama School of Fine Arts Alumni Association, board member of the Alabama School of Fine Art Foundation, board member with the Railroad Park Foundation, former member of the Birmingham Zoo Junior Board, former member of the UAB Minority Health and Research Committee uh, Young Professional Board, member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and Judge Patton has re received her JD, her law degree from Thurgood Marshall School of Law in 2003. Next, I'd like to introduce, thank you Judge Patton for being here. Oh, thank you for including. Next, I'd like to introduce you to the Honorable Brooke Reed. She is a native of Montgomery, Alabama. She received her undergraduate degree from Birmingham Southern College in 2003 and her law degree from the University of Alabama School of Law in 2006. She served as a prosecutor for the city of Montgomery before being appointed to the 15th Judicial Circuit Court serving Montgomery County by Governor Kay Ivey. Judge Reed is married to Phelps Reed and has two children. She is a member of the Church of the Ascension and volunteers as a tutor for the New Beginnings Resource Center. Last but certainly not least, the Honorable Jay York, is a graduate of Davidson and Murphy High School. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science from Spring Hill College and a JD from Cumberland School of Law. He is a Reserve Judge Advocate General in the U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, he is also was in private practice until his appointment to the Mobile County District Court by Governor Robert Bentley in 2012. He was elected to the District Court in 2014 and appointed to the 13th Judicial Circuit Court of Alabama serving Mobile County by the governor in 2015. He is a member of the Alabama Bar Association, the Mobile Bar Association, the Paul W. Brock Chapter of American Inns of Court, group leader for Bible Study Fellowship International, Lions Club of Mobile, and Military Officers Association of Alabama. Uh, noticeably missing in this, uh, when I was, uh, I didn't have your bios and I thought I was gonna have to come up with my own. Uh, judge York was also United States Navy Reserve Judge Advo Advocate General. Uh, so, I, and I was curious, is that kind of like going to Auburn undergrad and then Alabama Law School? Is, did you have a conflict there, Judge? No, actually I was uh, commissioned in 1977 in the uh, United States Army's uh, Medical Service Corps, did that for five years. And then uh, when I got my law degree, that's when I switched over to the uh, Navy JAG program. So only a JAG officer with the Navy, not the Army. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, so like I said, uh, this is a this is a good topic pr handling pro se plaintiffs. I know uh, all these judges, uh, lawyers consider these judges lawyers judges because they have considerable experience and background, uh, actually being in the trenches, uh, litigating matters, uh, whether it be criminal or civil. Uh, tons of pre-judicial courtroom experience. Uh, I know I've been in front of Judge Patton uh, for cases. I've tried a case in front of Judge Patton. I peeled her and she won. So one for Judge Patton, zero for Fish. <laughs> uh, I've certainly uh, gone head to head with Judge York uh, when he practiced. Uh, always a good experience. And, and this is my first experience with Judge Reed, but I've heard wonderful things and uh, we share the same uh, civil defense background. So uh, with that, let's, let's get started. Um, you know, Pro se plaintiffs, sometimes that can work for you. Uh, sometimes it can work against you. Uh, and I just like to tell, tell you one, I think because we have so much time, I'll just tell you a, a, a quick fun story. 
Uh, judge Brad Bishop was a, a municipal court judge, and it, well, he might still be here in Hoover, and he, he taught municipal courts at Cumberland. And my first year out of law school, I would go, I'd try to pick up a case or two, and I, if you didn't get a case, I'd stick around and I'd watch the trials. And there was this one trial where this old guy, apparently he was traveling in excess of 100 miles an hour through three different jurisdictions. And he, he, so he got arrested and charged with excessive speeding, eluding police officers, trying to cause you know, harm to them uh, because he was speeding and also because he had uh, DUI. And so the, the prosecution put on this elaborate case and they had officers from three different jurisdictions. And when they were done, uh, he did not have an attorney. And Judge Bishop just looked at him. And the, and the guy said, Judge, and, and Judge Bishop smiled and said, yeah, Ray. He said, I don't have an attorney, but you know, I've been before you before, and you know me. And he kind of laughed. He said, I know you, Ray. Yeah, I do. He's like, well, have I ever lied to you, Judge? He said, no, I, I can't say you have, Ray. And he said, well, if these young men said that I was speeding in excess of 100 miles an hour, then I probably was. And Judge said, well, I appreciate you admitting that, Ray. And he said, you know, I, they say I had, had a little bit too much to drink. Well, I'd been drinking that night, Judge, and so I'm not even going to say I wasn't drunk. Well, again, Ray, I appreciate your honesty. He said, but Judge, I would never have intentionally put these young men in harm's way on purpose, Judge. I just wouldn't. I can't believe I'd be charged with that. So, well, Ray as you were driving through three different counties, did you happen to notice the, the lights in your rearview mirror? He said, well, judge, it's my practice that when you're going in excess of 100 miles per hour, you keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> Everyone started <laughs> laughing. And, uh, oh, Ray, no lawyer could have done a better job for him because he got out of that charge. Now, he got he convicted of the other two, but, uh, but that was a good one. So, but most times I think it's helpful, and I, I think the judges would agree, it, most times it's helpful to have uh, representation for the plaintiff. Um, and I know in the workers' comp realm, which is what we're here about today, judges, um, probably you don't see a ton of pro se plaintiffs that, in matters that are litigated because it's so easy to get a lawyer with the, and you don't pay them a lot with the 15% contingency fee, but uh, you probably do see quite a few when it comes to settlement. Am I right? And get before you? Okay. Well, you know, let me ask you this, and, I've, and honestly, I'm, I'm really glad to be asking you this because I've always wondered, Alabama Code Section 25556, when you are sitting bef uh, before an unrepresented plaintiff, and, or even when they're represented for that matter, and they're, they're presenting the terms of a settlement before you, you, you have a statutory duty to find that that settlement is in the best interest of the claimant. In fact, uh, a lot of folks call these best interest settlement hearings. Uh, do you, let, let me start with you, Judge Patton. Uh, do you feel like that statutory duty to find that it's in the best interest, is that duty heightened at all for you if they are not represented? I wouldn't necessarily have it heightened, but what I do um, make sure that I do is have them explain to me what they understand is going on and what that means for them going forward. Um, and, and I have actually a dialogue about what that means for them now, in the future, whether they have meds open, whether they're closed, um, if they feel like they are at their maximum medical improvement level. I, I have a conversation, but I have a conversation with everybody, represented or not, because I want to make sure that regardless, um, there's a full awareness of what's going on in court and what the settlement means moving forward. Okay. Well, and Judge Reed, let me ask you kind of the same question, but maybe in a backwards way, which lawyers are famous for doing. Uh, <laughs> if, if they're not represented, do you feel like you, ha you have to ask more or questions, or let me ask it this way. If they are represented, do you feel like you have less of a duty and you can ask less questions since you know they've got a lawyer and that lawyer is explaining the process to them? Uh, well, just by way of background, so for 13 years, I, I was with a law firm in Montgomery. And even though I was largely on the workers' comp defense side, I thought it was really important to have strong relationships with the plaintiff's bar because there's a, a level of respect and trust, I think, when you have good working relationships. And I, and I tell everybody, I think collegiality is something that needs to be strengthened and that is so important um, because we are advocates for you know, clients as lawyers on either side. 
Um, but I think having good working relationships is very, very important. I say all of that to say that as far as pro se plaintiffs are concerned, like Judge Patton said, um, I think my set of questions is largely the same, regardless of whether uh, the employee is represented. I will say, you know, obviously taking greater care to make sure the employee understands you do have the right to hire a lawyer, um, that, you know, if medical benefits are being closed, sort of explaining the implications. I think what's difficult for judges is uh, to walk the line between, you know, obviously you can't give legal advice. And so the first interaction we often have as judges with a workers' comp case, you know, if there's no discovery dispute or motion for compensability hearing, we don't see it until it's a bench trial or a walkthrough. And so um, at that point in time, you're not really privy to whether there are issues of disputed compensability. In other words, you don't want to talk somebody out of a settlement and give them an expectation that they'll be getting more money if they try their case in front of you. But at the same time, you have a duty to make sure that they do understand what they're giving up and that it's an educated decision and that they're informed, um, I guess, before they do it. So I don't necessarily, to get to the point, I don't necessarily ask more questions, but I think you do take greater care to make sure that that employee does understand um, without overstepping your, your boundaries as a judge. Great, thank you, Judge. Uh, judge York, let me ask you uh, the same question, but with an added element. And we're gonna talk about the closure of medical benefits. Uh, if they don't have representation, but medical benefits is something that's being closed. And I know most judges look at the medical benefit closure a little closer than the other aspects because lifetime medical benefits are a huge benefit. Uh, are, are you more or less likely to approve a settlement if the plaintiff is not represented, if medical benefits are being closed? Well, I think you're much less likely to approve a settlement where they're pro se and they want to close medical benefits. You really have to look at it very closely to make sure that the, uh, the injured worker's interests are protected because if they don't have any other benefit, our, our future medical benefits for injured workers is extremely valuable to those workers. And I think a lot of times they don't even understand the value of that. And so if they do not have a lawyer, then I think you have to, at least I try to bend over backwards to make sure uh, that this settlement is in fact in their best interest. And there has to be a fairly compelling reason why I would approve that because more times than not, I won't approve those kind of settlements. If it's a compensable claim, they've accepted it, there's a likelihood of the need for future medical treatment. Uh, I just, it's, it's a tough sell there. Okay, and so that's a, with that answer, this is a good uh, next question. And I'm gonna ask all three of you the same question. Um, and that question is, if you do not approve the settlement, do you ever encourage them to go out and get an attorney or do you offer them any sort of advice on what their next step is other than I'm just not approving the settlement. And this is with them not being represented, of course. Uh, let me stick with you, Judge York. Uh, you go first with that one. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you have to be a little bit careful with that, but certainly I give the injured worker every opportunity and I tell them, so look, you may very well want to talk to an attorney. And, uh, and I give them the bar association's names because we keep a list of people at the bar association who specialize in workers' compensation cases. Uh, and I suggest they may talk to their friends or other people, but they absolutely need to talk to a lawyer and get a lawyer's input and advice before they proceed. Great. Judge Patton, how about you? Let's say I always encourage pro se's to, um, especially in workers' comp settlements, to seek the advice of an attorney. If they can afford one, we have a volunteer lawyers association that was in the courthouse before COVID hit. Um, and I would send them down there, continue the case to give them an opportunity to meet with them. Um, and I've even suggested them going and seeking um, the intervention of an ombudsman as well. Um, I just wanna make sure that the litigant has a full awareness and understanding of what it is they're signing off on. Um, and if that is in fact in their best interest. Okay, and Judge Reed, uh, Judge Patton added another element to the question uh, with the ombudsman. So do you, would you recommend an attorney that they go out and get an attorney? Maybe we recommend that they go to the local bar association like Judge York said, or, or perhaps like Judge Patton said, maybe uh, suggest that they contact an ombudsman to the Department of Labor. 
Yeah, well, first of all, it's usually easier for both sides. I mean, if you have somebody who's proficient in workers' comp, a lot of times it's easier for the defense lawyer um, as well to kind of navigate that process. But as, as we were talking about, have you not approved a settlement? Um, this just came to mind that um, the listeners, the attendees may be interested in. I actually just less than a month ago had the opposite where um, there was a really uh, a great lawyer on the plaintiff side who did an incredible job. The case had been litigated for four years. Uh, the case was settled um, on the record. And afterwards, there was a motion for relief under Rule 60. And the employee claimed that he was under duress and all these other things when he signed a settlement agreement. And we, we went through a hearing on all of that. And ultimately, I gave him the opportunity to um, allow his counsel to withdraw, to seek new counsel. And I said, if you really want your day in court, you know, you can have it. I kept the case because I, I really wasn't familiar with the settlement terms. I mean, I, I obviously knew the amount, but I didn't know much about the case. We tried that case. Um, he proceeded without a lawyer to trial, even though I gave him ample amount of time to get a new lawyer. He did better than I thought he was going to do, uh, presenting evidence. But I will tell you, unfortunately, he called a lot of hostile witnesses who were still current employees of the employer. And the issue in that case, the reason I bring it up, and, and this is sort of what judges sometimes aren't privy to, but there was no doubt in that case, there had allegedly been an assault by his supervisor and the entire issue turned on, did he have a physical, because he was claiming psych psychological trauma and he actually had a psychiatrist relate his an aggravation of his psychiatric symptoms to this event that happened at work. The problem was there was no physical injury and he didn't present any records indicating that there was a physical injury, though he said he was slapped in the stomach area. So I guess all of that to say in that case, um, the lack of a physical injury ended up being a bar to recovery and it was the, the reverse. I maybe bent over backwards where in, in hindsight, I shouldn't have, I should have just enforced the settlement because it, it was a remarkable settlement for him and in his best interest. And I probably still lose sleep over that one, but. Um, but yes, I, I do try uh, at all calls to make sure people know they can hire a lawyer and to steer them in that direction if they, they can find one. You covered a lot of ground on that answer. Sorry, I know. I, I, you're going to have to keep oh, me on I task. Talking points here, Judge Reed. You can't answer all of them in the same. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm still going to call on you. Uh, Judge York, uh, let me ask you this because Judge Reed kind of led into this which uh, in her case uh, was unique in that, is very unique in that she approved the settlement. Um, but what if you don't approve the settlement and the matter goes into litigation? Um, technically it's, it's usually already a filed case if it's in front of you just for purposes of settlement. So does your best interest duty that, that's, that you have that's put on you for purposes of settlement does that go away when the matter goes into litigation or, or, or do you put that in the back seat? And because really with the best interest with, with that duty upon you, you kind of lose your neutral status. Would you agree or disagree with that? Well, I think it depends on the facts of the case and how much and in, how involved you got in the process of uh, looking at the settlement. Uh, I think at any point in time, any judge who feels like that he is, he or she has lost uh, his or her ability to be fair and impartial. They have a duty to recuse, and and I know that uh, that we would do that. If you don't feel like that has occurred, you can still be fair and impartial. Then I don't see any reason why you would keep the case. You wouldn't keep the case. It, but again, it depends on the facts. It depends on how much information you received at the time. And uh, there's no way you know, that I can see that you can come with a hard and fast rule on that, other than just looking at it based on the facts. That was a good lawyer answer, Judge. That's, <laughs> that depends on the facts. That's a good, so hold on one second. Oh, we have a question from one of the attendees at home. What if we use what? What if we slap the medical judge? 
Okay, so uh, we've got someone that's asking, what if we use a, a, a vendor, in this case, Amatros, to help us close out the medical, would that change your mind? Um, they wanted you to answer this, Judge York. Are you familiar with Amatros? No, are you, is this similar to a Medicare set-aside or how does that work? Right. I haven't had a case so, like that with... So, so I guess that's the question is, if, if they're gonna, if you're do a, a professional MSA, is that gonna weigh in on your decision to close medical? It could, uh, it just really depends again. And I know that I keep, I hate to keep saying this, but it really depends upon the facts. Uh, and it looks, and it has to, and it depends on what the injury is. It depends on whether or not that worker down the road is gonna be able to establish causation. Um, and also whether or not you feel like it's that they're trying to unfairly put the burden on Medicare. You know, I think all those are factors you have to consider. But there are times when uh, I have approved a settlement uh, because they had a Medicare set aside in place and there are times when, when I haven't. It just depends on the, on the facts. A Medicare set aside is, um, as a general rule, is not as good as the future medical benefits under our Workers' Compensation Act as a general rule. But there are times when it's advantageous to have a Medicare set aside. Okay. So Judge Patton, if, if, let's say during a benefit review conference, or I guess a best interest conference, when you're considering whether or not to approve a settlement, and you decide uh, that you don't feel like it's enough money, um, is, is that something, I've had some judges, well, they'll voice that in the hearing. They'll say, I'm not going to approve it. I don't think it's enough. Uh, and, and then they will, they will hold on the case for litigation. Um, in, in your mind, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't feel like it's enough, do you feel like you can hold on to the case for litigation? Or do you feel like you should transfer the case to another judge? I usually um, start asking questions. How'd you come up with these numbers? What allowed you to get here? I make sure that the plaintiff is fully aware of the circumstances. But if I get to the point where I've made the determination, no, this is not enough. I'm not accepting it. It's not reasonable. I don't know the facts completely. Um, so I keep the case and I'd wait and see. Um, I think you can tell early on from reading the medical records, um, reading the reports, where it's going and why it got there. Um, so I think that it's one, a case by case scenario. But if my interest is I don't fully understand why we're at this number um, and you can't explain it to me, I'd hold on to it. I don't necessarily feel like because I've decided, you know, on the very short information, the limited, excuse me, information that I have, that it's not enough, that I can't be fair and impartial later. Because once you get the medical records and you get all the information in the complete case file, I might be able to understand why we got to this number. It just wasn't articulated um, in a way that was convincing to me during the hearing. Okay. Have, have any of you, and just show with a raise of your hand, have any of you had a defense lawyer file a motion for a, a recusal based on the fact that she didn't approve the settlement and it has moved to litigation. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, let's move on to a new subject. Uh, and this is concerning uh, cases that come to you uh, after it's, it, it's been settled at the, and before an ombudsman at a benefit review conference. So Alabama code section 25-5-292 provides that any party can make a settlement binding by entering into it, signing the paperwork before an ombudsman, having the ombudsman sign the paperwork, but it's subject to a 60 day right to appeal on the grounds of fraud, newly discovered evidence or other good cause, kind of like the rule 60 that Judge Reed was talking about. Um, so when considering an appeal like that, do you weigh the grounds any differently if they are not represented at the time they settled before the ombuds. Uh, let's start with you, Judge Reed. You know, I, obviously with a party who did not have representation, um, you would hope that nothing was misrepresented to the employee. Um, I think you take care in that regard, but I mean, at the end of the day, it really comes down to is there good cause and is there good cause considering um, you know, what's presented to you. Um, obviously, with pro se plaintiffs, sometimes you have to kind of 
get through the weeds to kind of figure out, kind of distill it down to what, what was the real issue. Um, so in the sense that when you have two parties who are well represented, um, you know, you, you may be more likely to enforce um, or, or, you know, when you're considering an appeal, when you think that they both had able representation, I think you do weigh that differently than when one party was unrepresented. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really just comes down to is there good cause um, or not. And Judge York, have you have you had to entertain such an appeal? No, not from a pro se litigant, I have not. But I will say this, that um, my comfort zone is a lot greater if uh, I believe that the plaintiff uh, is represented by able counsel. Uh, I have a lot more of a, of, of a feeling that, that the interest or the, his, his or her interest is, uh, has been well protected if they have uh, a good lawyer representing them. If they're pro se, then obviously that heightens uh, you looking at it. And, if, and, and um, with respect to the conference, just like the other judges have said, you have to really look and try to dig for the facts to see whether or not that settlement's in that person's best interest and whether or not it should be approved. Okay, what, what about you, Judge Patton? Have you had to make a decision on an appeal like that? I have not had to make a decision on an appeal like that, but I'll, I'll tell you, if you sit down and talk to people, you can really get a sense of what it is that they understand and what's going on. So, you know, I do a lot of, okay, like, just tell me what, you just tell me what happened. What did you understand was to happen? Um, what actually happened and why is it that you feel like you didn't have the benefit of some portion of the conversation that you should have, that something was mis misrepresented or intentionally left out. Um, and I will say that although I've not had one of these, people, once they start talking and get comfortable with you, it, you seem to be able to push through the weeds and really get to the true argument. Um, and it, it just may be, I went home after I'd been fully apprised of everything that was going on and my wife wasn't happy with the settlement and so she told me I better get back down there and change it I mean that's <laughs> that's not enough but you just you have to sit down and have a conversation and be willing to put in invest the time in it that's it okay yeah yeah you probably don't see a lot of appeals I know uh, most of the defense lawyers are now putting 60-day waivers in, in any settlement paperwork so and, and it's never been really tested at the appellate court level. I don't know if, if that would stand up or not, but we certainly put it in there. And it's, it, I, I think that they, uh, they're probably less likely to appeal because of it. So let's move on um, to the less likely situation where you see a pro se plaintiff. And that's when they move into litigation. And um, I think it was Judge Reed that pointed out, or maybe it was Judge York that pointed out that um, you know, it's probably easier on everybody in the, even at the litigation stage if, if the claimant has representation. I can tell you from a personal experience that that turned out to be true because um, this was a, a case where this woman was claiming that vacuum fumes that no one else in the office could smell, only her, uh, were causing her all these respiratory issues uh, that no doctor could identify. Uh, there was basically no medical evidence that she had issues, much less that they were causally related to the phantom fumes. Her attorney ended up uh, filing a motion to withdraw from the case. I filed a motion for summary judgment, and they, um, we had to go keep going back up there several times, three or four times, in fact, because the judge kept giving her an opportunity to get a, a lawyer involved. Uh, ultimately, she never did, and the case was... Uh, the summary judgment was granted, but the reason I'm telling you this story is a month later, I get a call from the Birmingham Police Department, and they, as two detectives, and they told me they're on, the, they told me they were on my way to the, my office, and for me not to leave. Uh, I asked them, uh, could I please know why it is you're on your way to my office? They said, uh, no, sir, we can't tell you that. Just don't leave. So uh, I hang up and I have a small but very significant panic attack and I'm going through all the bad stuff that I've done in my life and trying to think, is, there statute, is that even a criminal act? And is there a statutory, statute of limitations on that? I mean, it was only 30 minutes, but it seemed like hours. And they get there and uh, they take me into a conference room and I sit down with them. And 
was like, what is this all about? And they said, do you know? And they told me her name. And I was just like this breath of relief. And uh, they started laughing. They knew she was crazy, but they had to do their due diligence. And she had claimed, she had filed charges against me that I had, this is back before uh, online filing. So you actually signed your documents. And so she claimed that I forged the signature of, of her attorney on the motion to withdraw. That was the claim. So I had to sign the attorney's name 60 times or however many times. And that was the end of that. And I said, why didn't you go to her attorney? And they said, we can't find him. I guess he'd skipped town. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I just I want to share that story with you. Um, let's talk about pro se plaintiffs and litigation. Um, when you have a plaintiff in litigation, or, or really even this would apply if, you, if you're trying to determine if the settlement is in their best interest, do you, do you have to make a determination that they lack adequate capacity? Is that something that you, have you ever had to consider that, any one of you? Raise your hand if you have. I didn't hear the question, Mike, would you repeat it? Oh, sure, yeah. Have you ever had a situation where you had a pro se plaintiff in front of you where you had to you had questions about their capacity, whether they had adequate capacity to make decisions on their own. You're talking about uh, intellectual capacity to represent themselves right. or mental capacity to understand what's going on? Uh, well, in your mind, is there a difference? Well, yeah, I mean, if they're just, uh, uh, if they have some real mental issues and they don't understand the, what's what's going on with regard to the uh, process, their claims, uh, their 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 right to proceed, and that sort of thing. That's if they, in other words, if they are have some psychological or psychiatric deficits, that's one issue. If they simply don't understand the process because they're not trained as a lawyer, they don't have any legal background. That's a that's an entirely different situation. Well, that, that's a great answer, and uh, that, that takes me off my talking points, Judge, but I'd like to follow up with that. With, with all three of you, uh, have you ever been in a position to either appoint a guardian or an attorney in a case to offer guidance or, or assistance in any way in a workers' compensation case? Not. Any, anybody? Not in a workers' compensation. Okay. Judge Reed? No, I, I just think a good mediator can be invaluable um, in a difficult case, a case with a difficult party. I mean, that that's when you really uh, appreciate mediators who do a good job of being able to, especially if you have uh, a pro se party, they can serve as a neutral and try to really explain and and come to some kind of understanding. But I have not had a situation where somebody I felt like didn't have the intellectual capacity or mental capacity to prosecute their claim. Okay. Uh, the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act is, is unique in that it allows either the employee or the employer to file the workers' compensation complaint. Do, do y'all feel that it's an aggressive move for an employer to do that, uh, by exercising the right for that statute? And, and if they do that, uh, do you feel like if the plaintiff does not have an attorney, they're deserving of more protection because they've been sued and they're a defendant rather than them taking the first move and being a plaintiff? Let me start with you, Judge Patton. I don't necessarily think so. Um, I've been in a situation where as an attorney, we filed, I worked for the city of Birmingham and we filed claims and sometimes it's just to get things wrapped up. So if we're just trying to put a pretty bow and close everything away. I don't think that's a problem um, at all. Okay, Judge York, how about you? Uh, I, you know, I think the bottom line that I think we try to do, um, particularly in a workman's compensation case where you have a self-represented litigant, I think the bottom line is you're just trying to get to what the truth is and try to render a, uh, the, the right decision. And so whether they're the uh, they, whether they're the plaintiff, they file the lawsuit, or whether they're the defendant in that action, uh, I just think you just have to go through all the evidence, all through all throughout the proceedings, and just make sure that their interests are protected in the sense that uh, you can. I mean, you 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 can't be their lawyer. You're the you're the judge. You're the impartial. Uh, but I think you can 
whether they're the plaintiff or the defendant, make sure their interests are protected to the extent that you can. And that the, and when the day is over, that the uh, right result was reached, the, the, the just result. Okay, would you agree with that, Judge Reed? Yes, I echo what the other judges have said. And I, most, most employers that I know just want no part of litigation. So they weren't eager to, to jump into lawsuits uh, if they could. Okay, great. Well, another part of that code section, 25588, has a speedy trial provision. Um, those are my words, but essentially that's what it is for workers' compensation. Does the fact that a claimant or a plaintiff is not represented, does that affect how you treat the speedy trial provision? Would you be more inclined to give, give them more time, less time, because they should get to trial faster or uh, more inclined to just whatever their request is to allow that for them since they don't have an attorney? This time, let me start with you, Judge Reed. First of all, I, I think it just takes more time when you have a pro se party because uh, generally to get the discovery done and to finally get to the point of sitting for depositions and things of that nature, um, I think that cases tend to draw out a little more. Obviously, whether or not the employees at MMI affects when you can try the case, obviously you see a lot of continuances for that reason. We do try um, to set cases um, you know, when there's a responsive pleading filed, we try to go ahead and get it set six months later. We're not always great about, but we try to keep up with the docket to make sure our settings are there so that at least we have some dates to work from that encourage both sides to get things moving. And then as I tell parties, you know, we're not going to hold you hostage if there, if you've been, if you've been trying to move the case and you have things that just haven't been able to to be done because the employee is still treating, they're not at MMI or other external factors, then those are always obviously to be considered and whether or not the trial date gets moved or not. Okay. Um, Judge York, let me let me ask you this. Uh, in the case, the vacuum fumes case I told you about, the judge, I had to show up three times uh, because the plaintiff wasn't represented. How much leniency do you give in that situation? How many how many times is the defense lawyer going to have to show up for the same hearing because the plaintiff won't get an attorney or respond to the motion? You know, Mike, that is a great question. And uh, I, I think what I try to do in those situations is remember that due process is a two-way street. Uh, due process works for the plaintiff, but it also uh, uh, the defendant and the, or the employer is entitled to due process as well. I try to make every effort to give that in the, the uh, plaintiff, the pro se plaintiff, every opportunity to get their best foot forward and present their case and all their evidence before me. Uh, but if I feel like they're being purposely evasive, purposely un uncooperative, and they're, they're, um, and it's working a hardship on the defendant, then you have to bring it to an end. You have to just say, okay, this is what this is the deadline, this is what you have to meet, and this is what, what's gonna happen if you don't. But as a general rule, if you, I think that most of the time there, there's a, the, the pro se litigants that have been before me, they really just struggle to try to get their case before you in a way that's, uh, that's, that's proper. And I think it takes them a little bit more time and I think you have to be willing to work with them and give them that. Again, the bottom line is, and I know I keep coming back to this, but you're just trying to get to the right result. And um, sometimes it takes longer to do that if they don't have a lawyer. Would you agree with that, Judge Patton? Um, I, I do. The sentiments of, of, of both my colleagues is absolutely true. I, um, I try to start every case. I make it a point to start every case with a scheduling conference. Um, and I do my very best to stick to the order that we have in place. Um, sometimes life happens. And you can't always, you know, coordinate and operate around our best laid plans, um, but I do do my very best. I try to make sure that I balance the interest of both the plaintiff as well as the defense, um, regardless as to whether or not they're represented. Um, but I will say, you know, I've had attorneys come off of cases um, because they aren't, they aren't, there's not a meeting of the minds between them and their clients. Um, and I try to make sure that I give sufficient time with an explanation as to why an attorney may be necessary to move forward. And if they choose not to have one, that's fine as well. But I try to give sufficient time for them to find another one if they need one um, with the knowledge that I'm not going to allow this to create a hurdle for, for us, maybe just a small speed bump in the road. Um, we'll take some time and make sure that you have the time to find another attorney, but we are going to move forward um, 
in a way that's reasonable with the court schedule. Okay. Now, you know, if, if they're represented, the lawyers know that they're not supposed to have separate contact with you when the opposing counsel is not around. It's called ex parte communications. So if they're not represented, the unrepresented plaintiff probably is not aware of that. So I'm sure you've had situations where they may have tried to contact you either by phone or show up at, to your office in person and want to talk to you. Uh, are the ex parte communications uh, prohibition maybe loosened a little bit since they're not represented by counsel? Or, or how do you handle that when they show up? Judge Patton? I have an amazing team um, that works as a barrier. So nobody gets in, um, no phone calls get past <laughs> answering them. Um, and people are not always happy with that, but there has to be an understanding that just like the other side can't call and talk to me independently um, without you here, you're not allowed to have any conversations with me about your case without the other side represented as well. Okay. Uh, what about you, Judge Reed, same? Exactly right. That's exactly what I was going to say. I make it a practice not to answer the phone for that very reason. There's a beloved retired judge here. Everybody probably remembers Judge Price, who I love dearly. He would answer his phone directly, which would sort of startle people because he was always at the courthouse, uh, you know, from seven to at least five. Um, but I have found that I'm not good at getting off the, I would rather there be the barrier there for that very reason. And there are times when people will show up in court, even though they're not on the docket and you ask uh, what they're there for. And they say, well, I just wanted to talk to you about this. And I, and I explained to them, look, it wouldn't be fair if, if the other side came in and wanted to have a conversation with me and you weren't here it wouldn't be fair to you and it's not fair to them for me to talk to you without them here. So we, we just can't do that, but we'll set a court date and, and we can talk about it, you know, at that time. Okay. Judge York, do you have anything to add to that? Not a thing. I think the, both of my colleagues covered it, uh, you know, in a very, very fine fashion. Okay. Well, let's uh, stick with you, Judge York. And, um, you know, as a defense lawyer, Another reason that I don't like going up against pro se plaintiffs that are litigants is then you, you have to be careful. Uh, you have to be very careful that you're not perceived by the judges that you're you're taking advantage of the situation or you're you know you're being unfair basically uh, in a situation where normally I'll, the only thing I'm concerned about is advocating for my client you know in an ethical manner. But uh, also I can't be perceived as a bully. Have you, have you, Judge York, had a situation where the litigant was unrepresented and the opposing counsel in your mind was acting inappropriately or taking advantage? Yeah, I have, and, and you just have to uh, make sure that doesn't happen. You have to call, you know, call, you know, uh, call a hand on that and, and uh, make sure that, I do two things. Number one is I try to make sure that there's none of that bullying that goes on, at least in my presence in my courtroom. If I think it is, I do my best to shut it down, but also try to go to great pains to explain the process to the pro se litigant in a way they can understand it. And uh, whether it's a procedural issue or evidentiary issue, uh, you just try to make sure they understand what's going on and how it's going to proceed. And usually before I start a trial with a pro se litigant, I go over the entire process from start to finish, what we're doing from the beginning and how it's going to end so that they're not surprised or feel like they're disadvantaged in any way because they're hearing something or experiencing something that they didn't know was going to happen. Do you, do you hold them as I'll stick with you, Judge York, since you brought that up, when you go over that process, do you tell them, Hey, we have rules of evidence. I know you didn't go to law school, but, but you're, we're going to, you're going to be held accountable to those rules. We have rules of civil procedure. I know you didn't go to law school, but you're held accountable to those rules. Do you, and do you hold them accountable to those rules? Yeah, well, I mean, you got to be reasonable about it. You just, it can't just, uh, just be hard and fast rules. But the thing I try to do through the process with the rules of uh, procedure and evidence, if you explain it to these pro se litigants, my experience has been, has been that they understand it and they see the reason for it. If you just, you know, issue rulings one way or the other and don't explain it, they have no clue what you're talking about. A, they're lost, and B, they don't understand and they feel like they've been somehow uh, disadvantaged. And so I, th I find if you sit and if you explain the process, explain the reason for the rule, and uh, whether it be a procedural evidentiary rule, they understand it and they, and they, can, they can handle it. 
Okay. Judge Patton, uh, do you do the same thing? First of all, let me ask you, have you had a trial where the plaintiff was not represented? Yes, I have. Um, and I agree. Most people just want their story to be heard. Um, mm -hmm. And they want you to do it in a respectful manner. So, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I allow them to tell their story. And sometimes some of the defense attorneys, prob it's probably to their detriment. I mean, but I let people talk. Um, but I do hold them to a standard. There are rules of evidence. This is a court of law and we're going to act accordingly, but there's a way to do that without being disrespectful to anyone and allowing people to have their opportunity to be heard. Um, so I think that as long as you're respectful and you are maintaining the spirit of the rules, there's no issue moving forward. Okay, and, and I think a seasoned, in a, that situation, I would think a seasoned veteran defense attorney would understand that and probably not keep jumping off his or her seat with objections. Uh, if they do that, do you tell them to chill out or do you just let them do their thing and uh, hopefully you'll get through it? <laughs> I mean, they're allowed to object. I'm not gonna take that from, from them either, but I am going to make sure that the pro se litigant does have an opportunity to have their day in court and to have their story told. And I'll just rule on the objections as they come. Okay, great. Uh, Judge Reed, uh, are you going to hold unrepresented claimants to the rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence in your court? I think what the other judges have already said is, is very accurate. I mean, as judges, you're supposed to be able to, to weigh, I mean, with the, it's just inevitable with that, with a pro se plaintiff, they're going to have to tell you some things. Hearsay is going to be included in some of that. And as a judge, I think you filter what you should consider and what you shouldn't. I do tell in the example I gave with the pro se plaintiff, I said, look, I understand you don't have an attorney here, but there are rules of civil procedure, there are rules of evidence, and we still got to follow the rules, you know. And so that being said, there was a point in time in which he sort of had rested his case, but he hadn't told his side of the story. And the defense lawyer did object to him then being able to tell me his version of the facts. I allowed it anyway, because I said, look, he needs to be able to tell me you know, what happened in his own words. I think that's fair. Um, also, I will tell you, get, using that as an example, there was one point in time when he was questioning a witness and he said, the pro se plaintiff said, um, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but you're just lying, aren't you? And he kind of got into that and I kind of tried to rein him in and I said, now wait just a second, you know, we can only ask questions. Let's just stick to questions. And you know what? He responded to that. He said, okay, I understand. And he regrouped and um, so I think you have to have a lot more patience is probably the best way to put it. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think defense lawyers know they don't have to sit there and object to everything because the judge should be able to weigh appropriately what, what is due to be considered and what's really not. I, we've talked about how uh, maybe defense lawyers in your court have, have acted in a way that you perceive might have been bullying an unrepresented claimant. But what about the opposite? What about a situation where you've got an unrepresented plaintiff that uh, maybe out of a lack of insecurity or for any other reason is going over the top the other direction and being a bully themselves or acting inappropriately in that situation? Well, first of all, show of hands, have any of you had a situation where you've had to deal with that? I have not. Okay. Judge Reed, you look like you're about to say- Well, not, I was saying not, not in a worker's comp case, no. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's move on. Uh, the Alabama Department of Labor has an ombudsman program and ombudsmen are provided for mediations free of charge. Uh, we've certainly seen orders for mediation across the state. In some, in some counties, uh, we're seeing more orders that uh, order to mediation with a specific mediator. Uh, Mobile would be one. Uh, if they're unrepresented judge, are you more or less inclined to order that a specific mediator be used or will you, b being that there is an ombudsman program available, will you just order the mediation? Judge York, I'm sorry, that was to you. Yeah, I was hoping you're gonna ask one of the other judges that. Uh, <laughs> we, because down in Mobile, we're blessed with a, a really a, a good group of mediators. Uh, we also have two great ombudsmen and quite frankly, uh, as far as that goes, I, I have confidence whichever way it goes. Uh, more times than not, uh, probably 90% of the time when I ask the parties 
if they have a preference with preference with regard to the mediator, they give me the same name over and again. And I think you know who that is. And I'll go along with it because he's a fine mediator. Okay. Um, I'm only, I'm going to stick with you on that one, Judge. Um, but I'm going to move on to another question because we only have five minutes. I was wrong. This is a topic that does take an hour. <laughs> so, uh, I just want to ask generally, I'm going to ask all three of you this. Um, How has COVID-19 uh, changed things for y'all re with respect to unrepresented claimants? Uh, are you more or less likely in the future to, to consider settlements via Zoom, even after the current uh, Supreme Court order, uh, unless it gets extended, it'll be gone at the end of this year uh, that allows for that. Uh, are, are you more or less inclined to continue that practice if they're unrepresented or, or are you gonna go back to the way it was and have everyone come to court? And I'll start with you, Judge York. Well, if in, in that scenario, if they do not have a lawyer, I, I really wanna meet with them face to face. Uh, I want to be able to talk to them and, and get that personal interaction. So uh, I would, uh, when the COVID uh, crisis pass, passes, uh, I'll probably require that a pro se litigant come to court so that we can have uh, a, a good, solid dialogue as to what's going on. Okay, Judge Patton, how about you? Um, I'll say I'm torn on that. I, I enjoy the in-person interaction. I think it's easier to um, really get a sense of a person and what it is that they're about in person. It's a little bit more difficult over the computer, but I do understand that with pro se litigants and sometimes just in general, um, it's easier just to log on. I can go to work and I can still be at home with my kids or I can be you know, doing the things in my life that I need to do without taking an hour or an hour and a half to come down the courthouse and park and walk up there and sit and wait. Uh, so it just kind of depends. Um, I can see the benefit of it, but I will say that being on Zoom has caused a, a little bit of apprehension about being able to actually get a good sense of a person and um, their ability to respond to me um, and me see them interact versus being in person. Okay. You have anything to add to that, Judge Reed? No, other than virtual hearings have certainly served a good purpose during a difficult time. I mean, it's allowed us to keep things moving and to keep dockets moving where people don't have a sense that courthouse operations were just shut down. So I think it's very valuable in that sense. And, and if you do have represented parties on both sides, it's a lot easier to say, let's, that's fine if you wanna schedule the virtual hearing and we'll just um, do it that way. So uh, I, I don't know what the future holds, but it's, it's served its purpose at least during this time. Okay. Uh, one last question, uh, and I think we can start with just a show of hands to see uh, if, if it's a yes, and then if it's a yes, I'll, I'll go to one of you. But uh, right now, what the, the Supreme Court has also said that if we get a settlement in front of an ombudsman, then uh, we file a motion to dismiss the litigated aspect, and it's to be dismissed. And I, this, this wasn't practiced in some places. And I, in Mobile, I think, at least with some of the judges, it was already in practice. Uh, but for, for any of you are, you, are you less inclined to do that after the emergency order is, is done at the end of this year, or are, will you still continue that practice? And a, a show of hands, if it's yes, I will continue that practice. Okay. Is this just the pro se let again, or if, with? That you, if, that if uh, you have a settlement that comes is settled at the ombudsman level and then they file a motion to dismiss the litigated case that's in front of you uh will you dismiss it yeah. i've got a i've got a yes from judge york and a yes from judge reed so just no, no i won't no no i i won't dismiss it if they're pro se uh i still want to see them and i thought that was the question earlier in the uh the, the seminar. i was going to add the pro se element to it to see if yeah. that changed your mind yeah, no, I mean, again, I, and I think my answer previously is, is more applicable here. If they have a lawyer and they, the lawyer is a, a good lawyer and uh, then the, they file a motion to dismiss following an ombudsman settlement, I, I'm generally okay with that. If they're pro se, no, I, I'm not. I want to I wanna talk to that person face to face to make sure they understand what they're doing. I think that's, to me, that's very important if, if that's possible. Judges Patton and Reed, would you agree with that? I think so. I think that's I think that's a good idea, and I think it also depends on what the settlement looks like um, and how complicated 
the language is. Um, if it's reasonable, you know, I, it just kind of depends. Definitely. Now, litigant, I mean, um, attorney versus attorney, I don't have any problem with it. It just depends um, if it's a pro se litigant. Great. Well, we just used up every single minute of our time. I, I really enjoyed this. It's it's been unique uh, to, to, to handle it in this manner, but we did it. Uh, no technical technical problems. So thank you for your time, judges. You. And I look forward to thank seeing you. you in court soon. Thank you very much. Definitely. Right. Thank you all. And, and thank you, audience. Appreciate it. So thank you, Mike, for uh, moderating the panel of judges for us. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Mike because I didn't get the chance to do that. He's a founding member of the Birmingham Insurance Defense Firm of Fish, Nelson and Holden. He received his BA degree from the University of Georgia and his JD from Covenant School of Law at Stanford University, where he was one of only eight students selected by the faculty for the academic honor of Order of Barristers. Fish is a past chair of the American Bar Association Workers' Compensation and Employers' Liability Committee. He was selected by his peers as Birmingham Business Journal's Best of the Best and Top 40 Under 40. Um, he's been in Birmingham Magazine's top attorneys in the field of workers' compensation. And most recently, Fish was inducted into the prestigious College of Workers' Compensation Lawyers. Fish is only the fourth Alabama lawyer to ever be inducted. So thank you, Mike. And thank you, judges. <laughs> Our next topic is, is an interesting one, of course, like all the others have been. This is THC, CBD, and the workers' compensation claim. So here to talk with us today about this topic is Scott Roberts, who is a founding member of the Birmingham Insurance Defense Firm of Burgess Roberts. For almost 30 years, Scott has advised and represented employers, insurers, and third-party administrators in the area of workers' compensation and general insurance defense matters. He has been named to the Alabama Super Lawyers publication. Scott is a member of the Alabama Defense Lawyers Association the Defense Research Institute and the Alabama Self-Insurers Association. And we're bringing back to the podium, Zach Mack. And earlier I indicated that he got his PharmD from the University of Tennessee and that was incorrect. It was actually right here at Sanford Pharmacy School. Um, he is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Corporate Pharmacy Services, which is a pharmacy benefits manager currently serving 150 companies in 50 states. So come back. CBD, TAC, and its effect on workers' compensation claims. This year is special for you because the back Mac is here to also talk to us about uh, the pharmacological aspect of CBD and TAC and its effect on the workplace. Now, federally, there's been no change in the status of medical marijuana. Marijuana uh, contains more than 0.3%. THC. There's no change in the status of medical marijuana federal law. It's still listed as a Schedule I substance under the Controlled Substances Act. So what that means is it has no medical purpose. It is according to federal law. It has no medical purpose. And it is likely to be abused. Now, other drugs that are included with marijuana under the Controlled Substances Act are Schedule I or heroin. Now, there was a 
change in December of 2018. The farm bill. What the farm bill did was legalize the people in virtual can can't hear. And what what the uh, the legalization of industrial hemp did was it. it that's how CBD or cannabidol is uh, is extracted from industrial hemp, and it made that legal. Now Zach's going to tell us more about cannabidiol, and it's a it, the basics of it and its effect on workers' comp claims and the uh, on the job uh, on the job injury claims. Zach, thank you, Scott. Sorry for the interruption. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Uh, so I have no doubt that all of you have seen. CBD stores proliferate on every corner where you can put one, stocking all sorts of products, making all kinds of wild claims that it will treat basically any condition you can imagine. Uh, and so I'd like to start today by kind of covering some of the basics so that we can maybe get past that and, uh, and try to figure out the things that it can help us with in work comp potentially. Um, so cannabidiol is one of the, is one of about 200 compounds that are extracted from the resin in the flower of the hemp plant. Okay, it's uh, the, the resin with the right amount of CBD in it is not technically the industrial hemp that we're used to that makes rope and, and clothes and all sorts of products. This is something that is grown specifically for this purpose. It is very labor intensive to harvest it. It can't be done mechanically. Uh, so that leads to the cost you see of some of these products. It, it's not a cheap thing to produce. Um, there are about, out of all those 200 compounds that are in that resin, many of them have pharmaceutical activity. CBD is not the only one. However, that's the one that we're primarily interested in. My apologies. Is that better? Okay. Um, so as far as CBD goes, uh, the things that we can use it for for work comp, the main thing we want to look at is, is pain, anxiety, and sleep. Those are things that, that it helps for, uh, that it commonly helps people with. The, um, obviously, pain is our big concern uh, with CBD. Now, you might be interested to know, or if you keep up with CBD, you've probably seen that there is a prescription product that has been approved by the FDA by the name of Epidiol. Uh, that actually is a, a prescription CBD that has only one indication right now, and that is for seizure disorders. Okay, so with that one, there was there was quite a bit of bad, uh, or I shouldn't say bad; it was true, but negative uh, information that came out from the trials of it, showing liver injuries, uh, some pretty severe drug interactions, and those are things that, while they definitely do apply to the dialect. There are some things that, that make those results not surprising. Epidiolex is what is referred to as an isolate product. And before I go too much further into that, I need to cover the three big classes of products that you see with CBD. You've got full spectrum that contains CBD, it contains the legal amount of THC, along with all of the other uh, compounds that are found naturally in that resin. You've got broad spectrum, which is a very popular class now, which contains CBD and everything except THC. And then you've got isolate products, which are CBD only. In general, in the pharmacy, not in a work comp setting, we tend to prefer full spectrum products. There's a synergistic effect of all those compounds that are present in the, in the resin in its natural state uh, that helps to uh, seem to, they work together. The, uh, the different compounds in there seem to improve each other's efficacy. With when each thing you remove tends to lead to decreased efficacy. So by, you know, once you know that, you'll realize that broad spectrum is going to be preferable even to isolate. The more things you remove from the oil and the closer you get to just having pure CBD, the, in general, for most people, you're gonna need higher doses to get the equivalent effects and you're also going to, because of those higher doses, you're going to expose yourself to more adverse reactions and more drug interactions. 
And so when you know that, you'll realize that the results that were seen in the trials with that dialect weren't entirely surprising because it is an extremely concentrated and potent and high dose that is used to treat the people with seizure disorders. The doses that we would use to treat a person in off the street or potentially treat pain and work comp are much, much lower, a small fraction of the doses that are used with epidiolex. So, you know, once you know that, I really think that there are some opportunities in work comp for CBD potentially. Thanks, Zach. I wanted to talk about the status of medical marijuana in the state of Alabama. Now, last year on May the 9th of 2019, one day before I spoke at this seminar, the Alabama Senate passed a medical marijuana bill. They passed the CARES Act. And what the CARES Act was set to do was to make medical marijuana legal for select patients that had qualifying conditions. And uh, once it passed the Senate, it went to the Alabama House. And the Alabama House did not pass, uh, did not agree to pass the CARES Act. But what they did do is establish an Alabama Cannabis Medical Study Commission. And that commission was made up of doctors and pharmacists and lawyers. They took testimony and reviewed evidence over a period of time. And what the commission did was they said medical marijuana definitely has a beneficial purpose that can help people suffering from certain qualifying conditions. And they uh, recommended that the legislature pass a medical marijuana bill in the state of Alabama. Now, in March of this year, the Senate again passed another medical marijuana bill. It was known as the Compassion Act, or is known as the Compassion Act. And like the CARES Act in 2019, the Compassion Act would legalize medical marijuana for certain individuals with qualifying conditions. Now, the difference is under the CARES Act in 2019, uh, medical marijuana was only, uh, it's only possible to use medical marijuana after all other uh, normal treatment options had failed. Under the Compassion Act in 2020, it could be, medical marijuana could be a first line medical treatment, even if no other medical treatments had been tried yet. Now, uh, I've talked about qualifying conditions. The qualifying conditions, there's a, a host of them, but the ones that would be applicable to workers' comp, and I think in an on-the-job injury setting, would be chronic pain, would be anxiety, would be PTSD, would even be opioid addiction. I know I've had a couple of cases, and some of y'all may have some too, where uh, an injured worker gets addicted to opioid because of the treatment that they have to take a take it for a long period of time because of the treatment they receive. And under the Compassion Act, medical marijuana can be used to help that, help that person get off, of, uh, get off of, of opioids. Now, the Compassion Act was set to go before the House of Representatives in April of this year. And as you can imagine, the House never got to it. And that's because the coronavirus hit. And there were a lot more important things that the legislature had to take up besides medical marijuana. But it's still out there. Uh, it's, it's something that I expect the legislature will take again next year, assuming we are over this coronavirus. Uh, one of the things that the Compassion Act was going to establish was a medical cannabis study commission. And what that commission would do would monitor the seed to sale tracking of medical marijuana. It would develop a patient registry it would license, it would uh, handle the dosage information, and the medical marijuana would have to be grown in the state of Alabama. So under this Compassion Act, what protection are there for employers? Well, the Senate included several protections for employers under the Compassion Act. One is that in a workers' compensation setting, we still have the defense of no compensation, that's TTD benefits or indemnity benefits, are owed if an injured worker suffers an injury or death because they are impaired by medical marijuana. All right, now no TTD is owed. As I'll explain in a minute under the compact, the employer would still be responsible for providing medical treatment. Uh, the Compassion Act would not affect the employer's ability to deny compensation or to establish affirmative defenses 
in work comp cases. The Compassion Act would not prevent employers from establishing drug-free workplace policies and from requiring mandatory drug testing. The act would not prevent employers from terminating employees who tested positive for marijuana, be it medical or otherwise. The act would not affect the work comp premium discount that employers are currently, uh, employers currently get that established drug-free workplace policy certified by the Alabama Department of Labor Workers' Compensation Division. And lastly, the act would allow employers to ask employees and, and require that they notify the employer if they have a medical, medical cannabis card. In other words, if they were uh, entitled under Alabama law to, uh, to receive medical marijuana. So what are some of the, from a pharmacy standpoint, what are some of the issues uh, and potential benefits of medical marijuana in the workplace setting, Zach? So some of the potential benefits that we that work comp patients in particular could see with medical marijuana or CBD, the, the main one we would be looking at is pain reduction, reduction in pain score. And then also uh, definitely this applies to both medical marijuana and CBD. You tend to get much improved sleep. People tend to fall asleep easier, specifically with CBD, your quality of sleep tends to be better. We all know how much that affects your, your mood on a daily basis. Uh, and also can affect healing and those kind of, from injuries, that kind of thing. So uh, definitely that is something that potentially would be a great benefit in the work comp population. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about CBD in particular uh, and, and the fact that we need some clarity from the federal government to make it, I think, more likely to be compensable by work comp. Uh, and that is, so, once, once you had the farm bill that Scott mentioned uh, earlier, you saw a situation where the market was flooded with CBD products, okay? And every ad you see says it's legal in all 50 states. Uh, and, and that's seemingly true. Uh, however, the FDA has issued guidance that says that CBD cannot be marketed as a supplement because it, it is actually a, a product in an approved, in an FDA approved drug, epidiolex that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so by that standard, CBD is a drug, not a supplement, okay? We're, we're all good so far. The issue comes in to the fact that we're selling it OTC and it's a drug that has never been approved. Uh, epidiolex is approved in its form specifically but there has never been an OTC review of CBD. I think that's something, and you'll rarely hear me ask for more government guidance, uh, but I think that's something that we need further clarity on before we get into whether or not work comp should be paying uh, or whether, whether or not it's a, a legitimate option. Um, you know, and, I mean, I think that's something that we, that we have to have really, uh, if we're gonna go down this road. Um, and then as far as the pitfalls, uh, of CBD, and this applies to work comp and just a general use of it. CBD definitely has some significant drug interaction. Epidiolex has a risk for it. Certainly epidiolex has a higher risk for it based on those dosages. But even at the low doses common in OTC, you, you have a risk of, uh, uh, of drug interaction. So uh, that's why when we were in discussions with the state board to be able to sell CBD at our pharmacy, uh, one of the things that I discussed with them repetitively was, hey, look, you've got people who take medications every day and they're buying this at the gas station. You know, they're, they're buying this. They can't ask the clerk at the gas station about drug abuse. Why can we not sell this in the pharmacy where we have access to your medication profile, where we have knowledge about things that you can or cannot take with it? It, it, it didn't make any sense. And, I, and I'm glad that they changed that and made it okay for us to sell it in the pharmacy where we can do you know, some real counseling and make sure that people are using it safely. Because when you eliminate the drug interaction, the safety profile of it at the strengths that are common in OTC is outstanding. It's one of those things where for most people that come in and ask me about it, I say, hey, look, it's not gonna hurt. As long as we check off just a couple of boxes here, you can use this, you can try it, give it a shot. It may be of great benefit 
it may be that you wasted $25 on a bottle of medicine, but there's very little downside once you get past that cost. Uh, so, I mean, I, I would love to see it be available as just another tool that we have in that call. I mean, we were up here earlier talking about the opioid crisis. We've got something here that can directly benefit people's pain scores and quality of life. And, you know, we're not using it in work comp. So, yes, there are some hurdles to get by to, to make it where it's something that we can use, but it's probably worth the effort in my opinion. All right, let's talk briefly about the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act. And we'll talk about marijuana and for CBD. We'll talk about it, it, whether it's legal or it's not, it doesn't matter. And this I touched on earlier when I was talking about the Compassion Act. Under the Alabama Work Comp Act, no compensation, no TTD benefits or PPD benefits are owed if an employee is injured because of impairment by drugs or alcohol, legal drugs or illegal drugs. That's something that would give us an idea in the future if medical marijuana is something that's passed in, in this state. Now, it's conclusively presumed under Alabama's Work Comp Act that if somebody tests positive for drugs, they're impaired as a matter of law. What that means is they can't come back and say, well, I was in a room and people were smoking and I got secondhand smoke or I took CBD that had too much THC in it. And that's why I have a positive drug test. It would not matter under Alabama they are conclusively presumed to be impaired. Now, the employer has the burden of proving that the impairment caused the worker's injury. How does the employer do that? Well, one way is uh, co-worker observations of the employee who tested positive. Uh, their job performance, whether they had slurred speech, whether they had dilated eyes, whether they were stumbling around, whether they had other accidents or near miss accidents. Uh, whether they smell the marijuana. Uh, another method of proof is statements from co-employees that may have noticed these same things. The problem with, with marijuana is there's not a test to determine if somebody is under the influence of marijuana at the time of an injury, like there is a blood alcohol test. You, know, you can take a blood alcohol test and determine somebody has 0.15 alcohol. You can't do that with marijuana. In fact, somebody could have ingested marijuana with up to 30 days before an accident. They're going to test positive. The thing for the employer is they're going to get that defense that no compensation is owed because that employee was impaired by mar medical marijuana, illegal marijuana, alcohol, doesn't matter. Now, the employer will still owe medical benefits regardless of the impairment of the employee. So that touches on CBD a little bit and the fact that it's not regulated by the FDA and you can get it from all sorts of different sources. It can have different levels of THC in it. I think, I believe CBD is defined as uh, something with less than 0.3% THC in it. And studies have shown that uh, buying from different resources on the internet can have all sorts of different levels of THC that might trigger a positive drug test. And that employee is going to be out of luck if they test positive in Alabama, regardless of how they ingested the THC. Same thing with the Department of Transportation, safety sensitive jobs. Uh, they don't give any quarter that somebody tests positive for an illegal substance. Remember under federal law, marijuana is an illegal substance. Uh, until that law changes, that's just the way it is. So Alabama doesn't really deal with medical marijuana or CBD yet. How do other states deal with it? Right now, there are 33 states in the District of Columbia that have legalized medical marijuana. There are 11 states that have recreational marijuana. Now, even in those states that have legal marijuana, none of them allow employees to use medical marijuana in the workplace. None of them at all. Likewise, none of those states allow for the employee to recover benefits if their injury was caused by intoxication to medical marijuana or CBD or unadulterated CBD or whatever the reason. The issues in the states that have medical marijuana uh, from a work comp standpoint are one, is it reasonable and necessary medical treatment? And if it is, 
is the employer or the insurance carrier and in, uh, required to reimburse the employee for the medical marijuana. And I say required to reimburse, there's no national drug code for marijuana and it's illegal under federal law. And that's the reason there's no national drug code. Likewise, since it's illegal under federal law, nobody can pay for it with a check because banks are regulated by the federal government. So the issues in these other states are whether reimbursement is required. And there are currently nine states with medical marijuana that have determined that it is reasonable and necessary treatment and the insurance company or the employer is required to reimburse the employee. One of those states is Minnesota. And, and that's important because the Alabama Work Compact is based on the Minnesota Act. So that may give us an idea of how Alabama will treat this in the coming years if medical marijuana is passed. Now, six states that have medical marijuana prohibit the employer from reimbursing the employee for marijuana, even though they've determined that it's a reasonable and necessary medical treatment. Four states that have determined, uh, four separate states that have determined that medical marijuana is a reasonable and necessary expense have said they don't require reimbursement or prohibit reimbursement. It's up to the employer. So that leaves about half of the 34 jurisdictions that have yet to speak on whether medical marijuana is a reasonable and necessary medical treatment and whether it's reimbursable. Now, an interesting uh, example is the state of New Mexico. New Mexico was the first state in 2014 that uh, legalized uh, or that had legal, legal marijuana that said it was a reasonable and necessary medical expense. And New Mexico has a medical marijuana program. And New Mexico requires the insurance carrier or the employer to reimburse the employee for medical marijuana. Now, what's interesting about New Mexico is they actually list medical marijuana in their work comp fee schedule. It's currently $12.02 for per ounce for dry weight ounce. So that's one state that is really ahead of the curve as far as saying it's a reasonable and necessary medical expense, requiring reimbursement and giving the employer some guidance on how much they're supposed to pay. Now, because uh, marijuana is illegal under federal law, a, a doctor can't prescribe it because a doctor has a DEA regulated by the DEA. So they can only recommend the treatment. CMS reportedly will not consider medical marijuana when they're establishing the cost necessary to fund the Medicare set aside. So what's the future of medical marijuana? And what's the future of CBD in relation to work comp cases and all the job injuries? There was a, a recent study from the Journal of, of Economics, Journal, I'm sorry, Journal of Health Economic Study. This was a 23-year study put on by Temple University and the University of Cincinnati that looked at medical marijuana and workers' compensation claims. And there were some interesting findings in that study. That study found that employees in states with medical marijuana where it was a reasonable and necessary treatment. Comp claims cost 7% less than states without medical marijuana. Now, that doesn't mean that there are less accidents or injuries because of medical marijuana. In fact, the opposite is true. States that have legalized marijuana tend to have more accidents, more car accidents, more on the job accidents. But what this study found was that work comp costs were down. And why were they down? Well, I think a big reason is marijuana is a lot cheaper than opium. Opioids cost a fortune, as we all know. And marijuana, if you look at New Mexico, is $12.02 an ounce. So I think that was a big reason that costs were down when the treatment was by medical marijuana as opposed to uh, opioids. Uh, another reason was that uh, medical marijuana allowed an increased work capacity for older workers. Uh, and it allowed employees to better manage their symptoms so that they didn't have to uh, use, have as many days off of work and incur, uh, incur costs to the employer for uh, TTD and like expenses. So what are the pros of medical marijuana and CBD? And, and Zach touched on them, I think. One of the pros is uh, it's cheaper than opioids and it seems like it's better than opioids. 
you know, opioids has been shown in studies reduce workers' productivity. It takes uh, an employee that's out, uh, that's being treated with opioids, typically misses a year longer of work than someone who has not taken opioids. Now, one of the cons is there is an increase in work-related accidents, and there's an increase in car accidents. But more research is needed, and Zach talked about this. Because medical marijuana is illegal under federal law, there are not federal studies being done. There's not trials being done. The FDA is not regulating medical marijuana. They are regulating CBD and that when it comes to Epidiolex, but all these products on the market today that you can get at CVS and Walgreens that have CBD and it is not regulated. And there can't be more studies and there can't be more trials until the federal government reschedules or deschedules marijuana as a controlled substance, as a Schedule I controlled substance. Once marijuana is rescheduled, that will allow more trials and more testing and more, more human testing. It will allow clinical and FDA oversight. Uh, and these tests can determine if medical marijuana is a viable option for opioid treatment or other pain management. And it will also help to determine what's the proper dosage of CBD or medical marijuana and if it's effective even uh, with treating workers' compensation claims or people with work comp injuries. Does anybody have any questions? Any comments? Any anything to add? Yes, sir. I think the House will make some changes in it, but, but I think there's such a groundswell of support for it. Uh, a recent uh, AL.com study showed that 75% of Alabamians were for medical marijuana. And I, I just think as the, as the population grows older and, and more people are open to the idea of at least medical marijuana. Now the, the Compassion Act went to great deals to say, this isn't recreational marijuana. We're not going to approve recreation. But I think, I think there's a good chance it will be passed, assuming this COVID crisis is over. Otherwise, it may be 2022. Anybody else have any, any questions or something to add? Or Zach, do you have anything else? That's, that's really all we got. Uh, it's break time for everybody. So I hope you all have a great weekend. And I appreciate your time. And Zach does too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott and Zach. Um, if you're in the room, don't forget to drop a business card in this fishbowl up here at this front table. I think we're getting close to, to drawing more door prizes from this room and from the virtual attendees as well. So we're going to take about, actually it's going to be about a 45 minute break. I'll be back about 3.15. Thank you. Wait, Lily, don't, um, oh, never mind. I thought you were turning off. Go on there, see if you can claim host. Can't.
Hi, everyone.
So is it that one? It is. Okay, on here, it doesn't look like that. All right, you're good. Ready? Yeah. Okay, we're going to get started back. We have a recorded presentation next for you. The topic is ethics, and it's going to be delivered by Sarah Cross Ryan, who is a shareholder in the Mobile, Alabama office of Carr Allison. Her practice concentrates on a wide variety of litigation matters in which she defends companies and individuals in retail and hospitality liability, premises liability, workers' compensation, complex litigation, and general liability matters. Sarah earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Vanderbilt University. She received her Juris Doctorate from Cumberland School of Law at Sanford University. Sarah has been selected by her peers for inclusion in the best lawyers in America for her work in personal injury litigation for defendants. She's a longtime member of the Junior League of Mobile and she served as chair of the Girl Scouts of South Alabama Fit and Fun Committee. Please welcome Sarah Ryan. Treatment, unauthorized medical treatment, and 
and worse power times. The Justice's application of these three rules to workers' compensation claims will apply. When we provide diligent communication and expeditious claims, what is the result? All workers' compensation claims begin to come into play in the future or are less in the future. So now, both your employer is important to you and never will face forever to handle the workers' compensation claim. One, properly report the claim. Two, prepare a first report of injury to handle the work accident report. Three, make sure your employees and supervisors are properly trained to respond to the claim of injury at the time the injury is claimed. Four, if immediate medical care is needed, provide the medical care. Provide the medical care to look like a number of things. It could be sending the injured employee to an emergency care. You could send the employee to an emergency room. Send the employee to an occupational medical physician. The important part in this is if you're taking injury seriously, you're treating your employees with respect, and you're allowing the injured employee to be referred for medical care either emergency or otherwise, if needed. Consult with the adjuster and or training on physician selection. If you don't know what to do, speak to the adjuster or your attorney on the best ways to handle medical care. Have the plan in place. But whatever you do, do not ignore an employee's request for medical treatment. Ignore the request for medical treatment will only result in harm and become in an unfavorable decision. And so we talk about some closure. What about the claim selection or the adjustment? You need to first investigate the claim. Take the injured employee's statement. Obtain written statements from orders already. Request executed medical authorization to permit the case to understand what was filed. Be diligent in your investigation and handle the claim. The adjusters are also in a position as well as they would be really good to me. The case counsel and all the best case managers select physicians. Recognize that each person's goals and roles will be different in the workers' compensation context. For instance, an emergency manager is going to have a different focus than you as a crime center. An emergency case manager's focus will be different than that of counsel. An emergency case manager's focus will also be different than that of the employer. An emergency case manager's focus is often on improving the medical condition of the injured employee, returning the employee to work, and providing medical care. The idea of improving the medical condition of the employee, returning the employee to work, those are matters that will be out of the workers' compensation act. The goal is to improve the employee. However, in a claim context, oftentimes those can be mingled with issues of relation, causation. A nurse case manager may address the relation with the physician, particularly on the request of the claim manager. But a nurse case manager's goal is on improvement of the employee. Period. Adjusters, claims managers, address requests for temporary total disability benefits and lack of reimbursement in a timely manner. If an injured employee is out of time for reimbursement, it's yes, it's yes. Did the injured employee have TTD benefits? It's yes, it's yes. If you don't know if an employee is entitled to lateral or TTD benefits, find out. Don't let lateral reimbursement requests sit on the desk. Don't let temporary total disability benefit requests sit on your desk. Handle them. Pay them. Move the claim along. Delay the providing benefits when an injured employee is entitled to the benefits of the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act. An office salary is common. It can make the handling of investigation of claims more difficult, whether that's because the injured employee is angry or because their attorney is frustrated. No one benefits from holding benefits from the injured worker when the injured worker is entitled to the benefits. Communication. The easiest and simplest thing you can do for ethical handling of workers' compensation claims is to communicate. Communication involves returning phone calls, responding to emails, 
addressing requests for authorization. Provide them the truth authorization as appropriate in a timely manner. Do not delay in authorizing reasonable, related, and necessary medical care recommended by the authorized treating physician. If there are issues of whether the treatment is reasonable, related, or necessary, communicate with the medical providers. Communicate with counsel. Communicate with the opposing counsel. Address the pending issue. Ask the questions that need to be asked to get the answers that you need to make a decision as to whether authorization should be granted or not. Prescription medications. Authorized prescription medications. This is one of the calls that I receive most often from opposing counsel. The injured employee is at the pharmacy. The doctor has made a recommendation, written a prescription, it has been sent to the pharmacy, but the pharmacy cannot fill the prescription because authorization has not been provided. The prescription may not be authorized because it goes to a third party service. The prescription may not be authorized because it requires a manual input to approve it. The prescription may not be authorized because it's a new prescription. Whatever the reason, the prescription is due to be authorized, should be authorized in a timely manner. If you're going to deny the request, don't simply ignore the request. This goes for requests for medical treatment, prescription medications. If you are going to deny it, and a request formally denies. Do not simply let the request sit on the desk. Do not let those calls go unrecovered. Do not fail to address the question. And along the lines of denying, do not deny or use utilization review on every procedure or test. That is contrary to the purpose of the act. That is contrary to the Alabama Rules of Professional Conduct. And I'm telling you to look the other way on a claim for a request that should be denied. No. What I'm saying is approve the treatment, the prescriptions, give authorization, provide the benefits to which the employee is entitled under the Workers' Compensation Act. Deny those claims that there is a basis for denial. Deny the request for authorization when there is a basis for that. Handle the workers' compensation claim in compliance with the Alabama Rules of Professional Conduct by following and complying with the laws of the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act. Respect an injured employee's representation by counsel. I know the phone rings, the injured employee wants to speak with you. They want to ask where their benefits are, where their mileage check is. They want to see the doctor. They want to know who they're going to the doctor. But when an injured employee is represented by counsel, that representation needs to be respected. Communication should thereafter be made with and through counsel, as opposed to directly to the injured employee. Have you ever been to the telephone? I remember multiple times where in school we would sit there and we'd play the telephone. You whisper one thing in one person's ear, they whisper it in the next, they whisper it in the next. By the time you get to the end of the telephone and the person says what they thought they heard, it is nothing like what you said in the beginning. It's usually something like, I don't eat broccoli, but this statement made was, I brush my teeth this morning. Now, that's a very dramatic result from the telephone. But the idea is the same. When an injured employee is represented by counsel, communications that she may have with the injured employee, by the time they make it to the attorney, can be very different than what was said. Likewise, what was said to you may be very different than what they're reporting you said. Oftentimes, the simplest way to streamline communications is to have it directly. So once an employee is represented, communications should be made with their attorney. That way, there can be no questions about what was said. There can be no questions about what the date of input is. There can be no questions about whether or not you said that you were going to authorize that treatment or provide approval for that prescription. And obviously, the Alabama Rules of Professional Conduct apply to lawyers. The framework goes on to lawyers' responsibilities. But what does application of those principles look like for the attorney? They suggest you should communicate 
with the adjuster, with the employer, with the opposing counsel. The judicial response of both calls and emails and offers. Assisting the agency position recommendations. Provide evaluations and recommendations to the jury's overall future. Address the concerns of employees in time of employment. Similarly, I provide to the employees in time of prescription medication or medical treatment. Do not drag out the claim unnecessarily. Make recommendations that are consistent with the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act and the law in the state of Alabama. Earlier, I mentioned to you that by following the Alabama Professional Rules of Conduct and using these assemblies, that we could avoid issues that arise in the workers' compensation context. Those included motions to compel, issues over authorized and unauthorized treatment, and outrage claims. I want to call your attention to two important cases that have occurred in the last year here in Alabama. The first is Slayton v. AIG Claim, and the second being the ex parte Burks Mechanical Injury. In Slayton v. AIG, the injured employee claimed they suffered physical or mental injuries in the line of scope of employment to large variety of full circuit records clothing. He was provided some medical treatment, but he contends not all his injuries agreed to receive treatment. In addition, he claims that the defendants did not provide him with psychiatric treatment. The injured employee was ultimately returned to work by the primary treatment physician despite mental issues. And the same day, he alleges he suffered a mental breakdown based upon the denial of the psychological treatment, and that he was admitted to the hospital to the behavioral health unit where he remained for nine days. The injured employee subsequently filed a suit for outrageous trauma against a third party workers' compensation administrator and others, alleging he suffered a nervous breakdown because of the conduct of the defendants in handling his workers' compensation claim. The trial court granted motions to dismiss his work claims of fraud, outrage, and conspiracy based upon the exclusivity provisions in Alabama Code Section 25-5-53. The injured employee will appeal. The Alabama Court of Civil Appeals determines the trial court here in dismissing the claim. In doing so, the court noted that false summary judgment for the defendants might ultimately be proper in the future. The allegations by the worker were not, as a matter of law, barred by the exclusivity provisions of the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act. The Sleep vs. AIG case received much publication. Plaintiff's counsel was given the opportunity to quote from the insurance journal article, Alabama Court gives go-ahead to workers' comp suit against AIG Coventry, which was published on November 4, 2019. In that article, plaintiff's counsel said the following, This type of thing happens every day in Alabama in workers' compensation claims. It's ridiculous. It is outrageous. Workers' compensation companies treat workers in the state like they are dirt, and they should be ashamed of themselves. He continued to say, Lawyers understand the tension that higher premiums bring on insurance companies and employers, but something has to be done to incentivize workers' comp adjusters to stop basing their decisions on earnings. These quotes by plaintiff's counsel in the Sleep vs. AIG case indicate the plaintiff's counsel's case that there was a lack of ethical handling of the workers' compensation claim. The suit arises with regards to allegations that treatment that is requested was not provided, that medical conditions he claimed to have as a result were not treated, that his claims were disregarded. In essence, he indicated the claim was not ethically handled. His attorney's statements indicated that they believed that the decisions for handling his claim were based upon money. This is not a position that anyone involved in the workers' compensation claim wants to find themselves in. In ex parte Burke's mechanical injury, the injured employee employee filed a suit against his employer, Burke's Mechanical Inc., asserting that they negligently and unlawfully failed to provide appropriate payment of his benefits to him after he was badly hurt in an accident at work. In response, Burke's filed a motion to dismiss the employee's negligence and wanted his claims against it, asserting that the exclusivity provisions of the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act bar those claims. The trial court denied Burke's motion to dismiss. Burke's Mechanical subsequently petitioned the Alabama Supreme Court for a written mandamus to direct the trial court to vacate its order, denying Burke's motion to dismiss claims of negligence, wantonness, and tort of outrage, asserting against Burke out of court, and asked the court to direct the trial court to enter an order dismissing his claims. The Alabama 
Florida Supreme Court concluded Barks did not demonstrate clear rights on the name of this month's president's business and declined to overturn the trial court's ruling. The court held that McCoy presented evidence that his claims arose from an aggravated pain, suffering, and mental anguish caused by Barks' failure to secure a perfect care. The Supreme Court learned that McCoy's asserted claims related to activities that arose after his workplace accident and not while McCoy was engaged in the actual duties of his employment. So, what do these cases mean? What is the importance of these cases? It means that claims relating to how an employer or a workers' compensation carrier handles a workers' compensation claim are not necessarily barred by a specific provision just because they relate to a work related injury. Handling a workers' compensation claim after the injury can create exposure for an average claim. So, how do we minimize these claims? Again, we minimize them by being diligent. We minimize them by communicating. We minimize them by expediting the litigation. Don't allow matters to sit. Don't allow matters to pen. Provide authorization for necessary medical treatment. Honor referrals by authorized treating physicians. Provide benefits as appropriate and provided for under law. For any matters that you have questions regarding handling, where you don't know whether they're authorized or not authorized, whether or not additional treatment is needed, rely upon your team, the team that you have built, the team of the adjuster, the employers, case managers, and counsel. Remember that as a team, you can efficiently and effectively and ethically handle workers' compensation claims. So let's switch gears and look at something that a lot of people have a lot of questions about, which is how can I ethically investigate a workers' compensation claim? What are the boundaries? In this regard, my typical advice is to use common sense. Does it make good sense? Is there sound judgment? Does it make sense to do what you want to do? Sometimes we have to be the ones that define what common sense looks like. There's an assumption that we all operate with the same amount of common sense or all think about things similarly, but sometimes we don't. In a surveillance context, I've encountered that a number of times because the idea of catching someone in the act, of catching them doing something that they're not supposed to be doing, is so enticing, is so exciting, that sometimes you have an individual or a nurse who wants to go to the bounds to get that information, and those bounds can cross some ethical lines. And we have to be the voice of reason. We have to set the parameters of what we can do ethically and what should be done ethically. So what can we do? What can we do within an ethical bounds? Can you conduct surveillance? Yes, within limits. What should I do when conducting surveillance? You should use your common sense. In general, you may conduct surveillance of injured employees or claimants when they are performing activities in plain view. If the claimant or the injured employee or any other reasonable person would have an expectation of privacy, then you should not surveil them in those situations. In addition, I recommend you keep in mind the objective of the surveillance. If your goal is to capture evidence of physical capabilities, then make sure that goal is reflected in efforts to surveil a claimant. Apply these principles of common sense. What does this look like? Can you conduct surveillance of the claimant mowing their lawn from across the street? Yes. Yes, you can. Can you conduct surveillance of the claimant at a grocery store? Yes, a grocery store is a public place. A person would be anticipated to be seen in plain view at a grocery store. Should you obtain surveillance of the claimant in the bathroom? I hope everyone here thought no. And should you obtain surveillance of the claimant by peering through the window inside your home? No. Next, I will show you a video of surveillance that was obtained of the claimant who was placed in physical impairment. For some background information, there were no allegations that the claimant was unable to drive as a result of the physical injuries that she sustained. Further, the surveillance was conducted at the vendor's discretion. When I say discretion, what I'm referring to 
we began to attack the threat surveillance for many of our period of time. We were trained to do this very good necessarily know we were ending our careers for a new life, whether the kind of home, stay home, how they leave our, or whether the credit we attacked the grocery store for But we trusted the members that we were trained to conduct surveillance in a manner that is ethically appropriate. So now let's take a look at this letter.
是不是应该高兴的那个？然后呢，不要随便发出那种。Instead of the client's kind of work, she gives the queen to the queen, which is very much specific to the kind of work, which is very good function. This surveil is great surveil. This is the type of surveil that she wants to obtain. We want access to the client performing physical activities. In this case, the client is moving by. Some of you can point out about the surveil. If you want to look at the this surveil is captured from across the history of the client's home. The camera was placed on the public property in front of the sidewalk. It was not on the private property of his neighbors, as that was not permissible. It was on the public sidewalk. The camera was also disguised as the equipment. It was such that if the person looked at it, they could not see what it was. That is okay as well. Again, the camera, even though it's disguised, is in the place where there would be a plain view of the planet. So he would have an expectation that someone could see him. There is no expectation of privacy, and therefore, that does not cross the ethical boundaries of what is permissible. Now, moving on to social media. Some of my favorite ways to investigate claims or comments is going to be through Facebook. And there are a lot of questions that come up about Facebook, similar to questions that come up about surveillance. In particular, people want to know how far they can go on Facebook in order to investigate their clients. So let's start with the basics. Can I look up the injury report on Facebook? Yes, you can look up the injury report on Facebook, and you should. What if they have a private profile? What if I can't see any information unless I have a friend? Ray has a no friend request. No, you should not have a no friend request. Many states have held that the action of asking someone to be their friend in order to look at their private profile is to see people in response and a violation of rules of professional conduct. One of the keys here is is it public information? It's similar to surveillance in that matter. Does there have a claim on public view? When a person has information available for the public to see, there's no expectation of privacy. This same logic can be applied to social media and to Facebook. Now, there are some people that will argue that information that they're posting on the internet is not for the general public. However, when a profile does not have a privacy setting, that argument is just an attorney. Many individuals post regularly on the personal and public information. They have a false sense of this issue between public and private. One of the distinctions that we find as we're investigating claims is whether there's security settings. Are they allowing the information to be viewed by anyone, or do you have to be your friend in order to see that information? While there is impermissible to trick an employee in order to obtain access to their Facebook page, see the tweets, to see other social media postings, if the information is open to the public, or if the employee's information is not privacy protected, then the employer, the client's adjuster, an attorney is permitted to use the information that they gather from the social media website in order to defend claims. In addition, an employer cannot trick an employee into giving them access to their social media by posing as someone else. Likewise, an attorney or their staff cannot send a friend request to an injured employee. This is not a request that should be made under counsel, nor should your counsel agree to friend an injured employee in order to investigate a client. Earlier this year, there was an article released where your face is admission over Facebook presence to gather information on the way. In short, the New Jersey attorney faces an admission for warning. For instructing his paralegal to become an adverse party's Facebook friend to gain information in litigation. One of the basis of this admission is that the lawyer was engaging in communication with the person he knew was represented by counsel. The attorney was also determined to engage in contact involving dishonest, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. The disciplinary review board is noted as indicating that the defendant's misconduct was neither unique nor new. It simply took place in only one body of form. The form, however, does not change the nature of the misconduct or the necessity for the defendant to be aware of his professional obligations. It's interesting to note, however, that the disciplinary review board was split. There were four members who called for admission, two others who recommended censure, a more severe form of punishment, 
and the three who issued an opinion was with no discipline at all. This tells you exactly how it is not the status of social media investigation and ethics are in a social media context. In an effort to address that, the majority of the disciplinary review board recommended to the New Jersey Supreme Court that they adopt a policy on using social media for discovery purposes. In essence, the board suggested that accurately reviewing publicly available information on someone's social media page should be permissible. Any attempts by an attorney, their subordinates, or agents, including clients, to gain access to representative parties otherwise private social media, however, should constitute improper communication in violation of one of their rules of professional conduct. The board went one step further and argued that it is against to access an individual social media, whether that person is represented or not, without disclosing who's making the request and the specific purpose of the request should be deemed conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation in violation of yet another rule of professional conduct. In this particular case, the attorney's scenario rule told her attorney that she was planning to send the Clintons a Facebook message. The attorney authorized her to do so. She sent a message to the Clintons saying that he would like her favorite hockey player. The Clintons responded by saying he hopes that was a good thing. And then he sent her a friend request that she accepted. After she was friends with the Clintons, she later saw a video of the Clintons on his Facebook page wrestling with his brother. This information was subsequently provided to the Clintons' attorney as information leaked from the Clintons' Facebook page. The Clintons then filed a grievance against the attorney with the Office of Attorney Ethics. One of the other things to know about this New Jersey case is that it indicates that one of the violations was communication with a person represented by counsel. We don't often think about that in the context of Facebook because we're not actually communicating often with the clients, we're just looking. However, that is something very important to keep in mind as we conduct these investigations. Here in Alabama, we have a similar rule of professional conduct, Rule 4.2. Rule 4.2 indicates that communication with a person represented by counsel. In essence, a lawyer shall not communicate about the subject of the representation with a person the lawyer knows to be represented by another attorney in the matter, unless the lawyer has the consent of the other lawyer or is authorized by law to do so. So this is also something to keep in mind. Even if the client has a public profile available, you should not use Facebook as a means to contact the client, to ask the client questions, or to communicate with them, particularly if that client is represented by counsel. Remember, if you're represented by counsel, you need to respect that representation, and communications need to be through the client's attorney. Other jurisdictions have also looked at the issue of whether or not an attorney should send a friend request. In New York, there have been two opinions that address this matter. The first is in the case of White Party. In the case of April 3rd, which was issued by the New York State Bar Association's Committee on Professional Ethics in 2010, the New York State Bar concluded that a lawyer representing a client in any litigation may access the pages of another party's social networking website, such as Facebook, for the purposes of obtaining possible impeachment material for use in litigation, but the opinion limited that access to the public portion of Facebook. In the opinion, it stated, as long as the lawyer does not, quote, friend the other party or direct a third party to do so, accessing the social network pages of the party will not violate Rule 8.4, which prohibits deceptive or misleading comments, Rule 4.1, prohibiting false statements from chapter law, or Rule 5.3.81, which imposes the responsibility on lawyers for ethical conduct by non lawyers acting at their direction. Here, the New York State Bar Association has issued a decision in Alabama that states that the New York State Attorney's lawyer agents may send friend requests 
to other prison parties if they use their real name. In short, the opinion emphasized the lawyer may not attempt to gain access to the social networks and websites under false pretenses, either directly or through an agent. The New York City Bar Committee acknowledged that the potential for the health defendant on these internet based sources may have attracted new weapons in the lawyer's arsenal through formal and informal discovery devices. The prevalence of those and other social networking websites and the potential benefits of access to websites may have ended. Present, however, ethical challenges for trying to navigate in this virtual world. The same thing can be said of the current suggestion for lawyers in the workers' compensation context. In looking at whether a lawyer either acting alone or through an agent, such as a private investigator, they resort to trickery through the internet to gain access to otherwise secure social networking pages and the potentially helpful information it holds. The committee indicated it would be inconsistent with New York's informal discovery process to flatly prohibit lawyers from engaging in any and all contact with users of social networking sites. However, consistent with that same policy, they concluded the attorney or his or her agent, which would involve a private investigator, may use the real name and profile to send a friend request to obtain information from an unrepresented person's social networking website without having to disclose the reasons for making that request. While their ethical boundaries and such shredding, in the police view, they were not promised from an attorney or investigator using only truthful information to obtain access to the website, subject to compliance with all other ethical requirements. The committee emphasized that the potential ethical pitfalls associated with the social networking site arise in part from the informality of communication on the web. In that connection, in seeking access to an individual's personal information, it may be easier to deceive if the individual is a person world than in the real world. For example, if a stranger made an unsolicited face-to-face request to a potential witness with permission to enter the witness's home, view the witness's photographs and video files, learn the witness's relationship status, religious views, date of birth, and perhaps even view the witness's personal diary, that person would most certainly slam the door shut and perhaps even call the police. However, in contrast, in the virtual world, the same stranger is more likely to be gaining attention to the individual's personal webpage and have unfettered access to most, if not all, of the foregoing information. In addition to New York, other jurisdictions have addressed this issue as well. In California, and the legal ethics opinion, 2011 2 issued by the San Diego County Bar Association, it noted that sending someone is not the same as being publicly available information on that person's social networking page. That San Diego opinion states that an attorney violates his ethical duty not to deceive by making his right request with a represented party without disclosing why the request is being made. That kind of analysis applies regardless of whether the person sought to be printed and represented or whether the person is a party to the action. In Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Bar Association of Professional Guidance Committee issued an opinion in 2009 2 discussing Facebook and MySpace accounts being maintained by a witness who posed a connection for litigation. The committee opined that the request from an attorney to a third party may be identified himself as counsel would violate their rules of professional conduct because the plan of communication with the witness was deceptive. Omitting the lawyer's identity would conceal the key facts in order to induce the witness to allow access to her personal information. So, one of the things we're going to touch on is that the question is if my lawyer can't sign a complaint, can I have a private investigator sign a complaint? And the answer is no, this is not recommended. Reasons for this can be found in that can be found in these other jurisdictions. Again, the Philadelphia Bar Association opinion indicates that a lawyer does not need an agent to find a witness in order to find out information on the witness's personal page because such a request is deceptive under the state's law and rules for professional conduct. Even if the agent or lawyer used his or her own name in the account, that action is improper because the purpose of the conduct from the target was not for friendship, but was for gaining access to personal information. And now note that that Philadelphia opinion is a little bit different. Because one of the other opinions that allowed an attorney to discredit a claimant provided they disclosed and used that they were real name. The idea being that if they provided their real name, the individual could ascertain why they were requested to be their friend and make a decision about whether or not they wanted to allow access to their personal private page. So in general and in sum, one of the good things to consider when trying to conduct investigations in an ethical manner is whether or not that information is licensed in plain view or visible to the public. 
If someone has their privacy settings set, then it is not public information, and they can be sent out with reasonable expectation of privacy. How far you can go to investigate that matter clearly depends on your jurisdiction, but looking at the guidance that's set forth by some other jurisdictions, it is clear that contacting a claimant through social media when they're represented is a violation of the rules of conduct. Similarly, using any type of deceit or disguise in order to gain access to a privacy page, that is also a violation of the rules of professional conduct. So then I often get asked, what can I do to gather Facebook or social media information? So my recommendations in that case are, instead of sending these friends requests, consider asking them for Facebook or social media information during discovery. The New York Opinion 2010-2 encourages rather than engaging trickery, lawyers can and should seek information using our social networking sites, such as Facebook, by failing to sell some informal discovery, such as the truth concerning non-represented parties, or by using false discovery devices, such as subpoenas, records, and non parties in possession of information maintained on an individual social networking page. Given the availability of the legitimate discovery methods, there is and can be no justification for permitting the use of deception to obtain the information from a witness online. So, in conclusion, although there's a huge desire to back action moments and to investigate a claim and find out everything you can, we still need to do so ethically and in an ethical manner. If you retain a vendor to perform the investigation for you, please keep in mind that those vendors, those investigators, also need to operate within the ethical guidelines that have been set for you, your attorney, may be responsible for the actions of that vendor should they cross ethical boundaries. And while we discussed today primarily the Facebook and the social media stores, these rules and these guidelines should be applied to all forms of social media, whether that's Twitter, Instagram, or other sites that may allow for access to information from our clients. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at 251-283-2870 or sryan at carallison.com. Again, I'm Sarah Cross Ryan, Car Allison. I want to thank you for your time today for this ethical consideration of the workers' compensation context. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me by the email at sryan at carallison.com. Thank you. She's here. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for that presentation. Uh, Bailey Mack is going to come back and give additional door prizes to those of you who are virtually participating in the conference before we move on to our last two speakers. Okay. Are you ready for this to be over, Henry? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. It does, it does sound like it. Okay, so we're gonna do some fun things for you guys here in just a little bit. We're just gonna get virtual out of the way so we can, after this last speaker, have you guys some goodies, okay? All right, virtual people. We have, we're gonna go, I've got about eight questions, all are for money. The first question, again, I'm going to read the question. The first person to put the correct answer in the chat box wins. First question is for $25. What made you attend the AWCO 2020 conference? A, great agenda, B, webinar options, C, needed the credits, D, boss said I had to. Thought we should do like the. Do, 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 do it. Oh, we know she's here. She here? Oh, we did not know that. I'm sorry. We thought she was done. I don't think anybody has any. He said. Tina Wingate gets the first $25, okay? So the next one for $25, how would you rate this conference agenda? One through five, one being the worst, five being the best. 
All right.